Hello there, welcome to the Saray channel and welcome to my Omnibus series. I've got so many of these Omnibuses that are going to come out so that you'll be able to listen to an hour's worth of stories which I know you're going to love. You know, the thing is that telling stories is such a fine art and it's something that was practiced hundreds of years ago when people didn't have the technology that we have today. And everyone would gather around the fire and listen to a wonderful story. And also, what is so wonderful about a story is that, personally, I think it is the best way to go to sleep. Every night when I go to bed, I always listen to stories. And that's something that parents used to do with their children. It's something that they still do with their children. There's nothing better than a good story. And so I hope you're going to enjoy this series. And before we start, I just want to say, do subscribe to my channel because you don't want to miss out on anything because I'm in for the long haul and I want to make sure that you get the most stunning stories to go to bed with at night or to listen to when you want to be one of those people sitting beside the fire and listening. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and let's get started. I hope you're going to enjoy the Omnibus. Dear Sarah and all your lovely listeners, the young boy sat in the back of the taxi cab on the cool leather seats in the white Honda. For a brief moment he twiddled his thumbs rather awkwardly, briefly glancing out of the passenger side window, and then began to steadily busy himself, playing one of those games on his cell phone, as it kept admitting that pinging sound. To look at he was about twelve years old. He could have been a wee bit older or younger, it was difficult to tell. He had a cute little angelic face, with two dimples on either side of his cheeks, a little cleft on his chin, and very wide innocent blue eyes. His trendy hairstyle meant that his brown hair stood up on end in spiky peaks, rather resembling a hedgehog. The look suited his cherubic face. He looked to be the kind of boy that would grow up to be a little heartthrob when he entered his twenties or early thirties. The taxi driver, Mr. Perinda from Bangladesh, who had lived in Pennsylvania since he was in his early teens, had been commissioned to pick up the young boy from this green leafy upmarket Pennsylvania neighbourhood where the family lived. It boasted coffee shops, bars, bakeries, boutiques and art galleries. He arrived in his car promptly at the allocated time, as Mr. Perinda liked to be punctual, and the traffic had been very good today. It was 3 p.m. in the afternoon. The boy's name was Jamie McKeeley, and with a name like that it was very easy to discern that the father was of Scottish lineage, as in fact Mr. Perinda had recognised his distinctive accent in their brief exchange, although the father appeared very aloof and remained standing in the doorway of their home, blowing his son a kiss. Mr. Perinda liked the Scottish accent very much, but he strongly suspected their son Jamie spoke with an American drawl, much like his mother did, as like his mother he'd grown up in America, probably here in Pennsylvania. Suffice to say the young boy had not spoken to him yet, but when he had briefly communicated with his mother, his voice had been so low, Mr. Perinda had not heard a word he'd said. The somewhat aloof boy, who appeared to be as reticent as his father, sat impassively in the back seat, and pretty much ignored him, as if he was a fly on the wall. Mr. Perinda realised that this young boy was likely not to say a single word during the three-and-a-half-hour road trip, which likely meant the journey to the boy's grandfather's farmhouse would be a hell of a lot more boring than he'd anticipated. When it came to jobs, you could not exactly choose your passengers, which was a dreadful pity as far as Mr. Perinda was concerned, because if he could choose his passengers, like the food from a menu... He would choose colourful people that wore their hearts on their sleeves and would talk the entire way, because when that happened, time dissipated as fast as the rising steam from a kettle. Mr. Perinda enjoyed learning about his passengers, where they came from, what they did for a living, what they thought about global warming and the dreadful paper straws they were now using to replace plastic. There were so many interesting topics of discussion he would happily engage in, where he could luxuriate in a kaleidoscope of people's differing opinions and insights, which always made his road journey so much more pleasurable. But a silent stranger, they were the very worst. This was going to be one of those long-drawn-out car journeys, 
but Mr. Perinda would have to grin and bear it. After all, he had a living to procure. Still, he could listen to some Rambinda Sangeet, or ball music on the radio, to keep himself entertained. Even though he lived in America, Mr. Perinda was very proud of his Bangladeshian roots, and celebrated them every day, by thoroughly enjoying the spicy vegetarian food his wife cooked for him regularly. He always wore the traditional orange turban on his head, which meant courage and wisdom, and Mr. Perinda, without being immodest, considered himself to be a wise old soul indeed. It would seem his car always smelt of curry powder and garlic, possibly from the samosas he enjoyed in the car. He tried to conceal the smell, but pungent, very stubborn curry spices were not easy to subdue, even with the strongest of car fresheners. Still none of his customers complained about the obtrusive smell, and at least he did not smoke, and a car that smelt of cigarette smoke, that was a hundred times worse, he thought. Mr. Perinda enjoyed chatting to his passengers when he took them to their different locations, but he knew a shy person the moment he laid eyes on them, and this unassuming young boy was as reticent as they come, and was unlikely to even say boo to a goose. "'Thank you so much, Mr. Perinda,' the boy's young mother had said, shaking his hand effusively. For a woman that was so slight, Mr. Perinda was clandestinely impressed by the boy's mother's firm handshake. He had known men, five times as petite woman's size, who had given him such a limp, fragile handshake by contrast. It had almost been pathetic. Mr. Perinda believed a handshake reflected your personality type. A weak handshake meant you were a follower, not a leader, and were easily influenced by the opinions of others, and struggled to have any of your own. A strong handshake meant you were ambitious, assertive, very successful. This woman's handshake was something in between, which meant she was likeable, well-grounded, reliable, fun-loving, and the kind of person you were likely to respect. This is my son Jamie here, she told him, ruffling the Twin Peaks affectionately, that proudly stood up on her son's head. The young boy looked annoyed, as he straightened his hair after his mother had played with it. He'd gone to a lot of trouble sticking it up with hair gel in the morning, which his mother was constantly messing up. You'll be transporting my son Jamie here, to his grandparents' home, which is three and a half hours away from here, roughly near Somerset County, which is known as the Roof Garden of Pennsylvania, but I'm sure you know it very well indeed. Mount Davis, I believe, is the highest point in the state. It's near where my parents live. Only they live in a more remote part. It's a little bit off the beaten track, I'm afraid. And it's terribly easy to get lost there. Mr. Perinda glanced down at the address the woman had given him. Ah, no, I don't worry about that. I know area well. A few remote farmhouses in those parts. But I will have no problem finding it. The boy's mother looked heartily relieved. Oh! I am so glad to hear you say that, Mr. Perinda. I was saying it's so easy to get lost around there. Believe me, I know. I grew up there, you see, so I know that only too well. Even when I had my own car in my early twenties, a battered old master it was, with a tail light that never got fixed. I was always getting desperately lost down those sequestered roads. And my long-suffering father had to come out to rescue me on several occasions. He was not best pleased with me, I hasten to say. I would drive around in circles, getting more and more lost. By all accounts, you can drive for miles, you see, and not see a single solitary soul in sight. My father, well, he's a very private person. He lives a hermetic existence. My mother is much the same, I'm afraid. They're a bit like two peas in a pod in that regard. They keep themselves to themselves. Now the farmhouse, you just cannot miss it. It's made of stone and wood with large sash windows. It's called Whispering Winds. Not a chance, madam. I will not miss it. I have a GPS, and these days I don't need to use it. I know my way around these parts like the back of my hand. So I shan't have any problems in that regard, Mr. Perinda had told her confidently, with a reassuring swagger that made the boy's mother physically relax. The furrows in between her eyes were ironed away. She let out an audible sigh as relief washed over her, 
like a cool breeze. She knew she'd done the right thing hiring Mr. Perinda. She needed a trustworthy, reliable driver who could be trusted and was familiar with Somerset County and the surrounding areas. Oh, I am so grateful, Mr. Perinda. You have no idea. The taxi company told me you were the very best. The woman who took my call, what did she say? She said, you can sniff out any location with a blindfold on. Now that is a compliment if ever I heard one. I only wish people would say the very same thing about me. But I have absolutely no sense of direction whatsoever. And thank God it's you, not me, driving my son to his grandparents' home. I'd probably need a rescue squad to come and find us, she teased. Me and my husband, you see. We're flying to Scotland for a break. For a week's break, that is. I'm afraid I haven't managed to contact my father. He's one of those annoying people that never, ever answers his cell phone. And even if he does, the cell phone reception in that area is hit and miss all the time. I wish to God he hadn't got rid of that landline of his. I can never, ever get hold of him. I tried all last week, but he just didn't answer his telephone, and it kept going to voicemail. Of course, I left him tons of messages, but whether he received them, God only knows. My father, I'm afraid, is not very enlightened by modern technology, and has no appreciation of it whatsoever. If he had his way, Mr. Perinda, we'd still be stuck in the days of the dinosaurs. I'd like you to tell him and my mother that Jamie will be staying with them for a week, even though I've made no prior arrangements with them. My parents stay at the farmhouse all the time and will be absolutely thrilled to see their grandchild again and be happy to take care of him for the entire week. But what if they're not expecting your son, ma'am? Oh, Mr. Perinda, don't worry about that at all. They will not be expecting you to arrive with their grandson. But that is fine, I assure you. They're at the farmhouse all the time, as I was telling you. It'll be a lovely surprise for them. They will be more than happy to take care of Jamie here and to get reacquainted with their grandson, whom they haven't seen in years. The last time they saw him, he was in a bassinet. A chubby little baby he was. If you're sure, ma'am, I don't want to arrive there and find the place boarded up. It would not be the first time this has happened to me, nor do I think it will be the last. Oh, I'm sure, Mr. Perinda, everything will be absolutely fine. Now, I spoke to my parents about three weeks ago. They sounded on top form, although our conversation was cut off. It's those mountains, you see. They always get in the way of a reception. Now, I would like you to pick him up, my son, from his grandfather's farmhouse on the 17th of May, when we'll be back from Scotland, and would be so grateful if you would return him to this address forthwith. Do you think you can do that for me, Mr. Perinda? You can pick him up from his grandparents' farm at 3 p.m., and then bring him back right here. I know you will have to make an extra journey to drive out there from Pennsylvania, on my account, but I would rather recruit the same driver for my son. Both ways, if you don't mind. Naturally, I will cover all the expenses. Please let his grandparents know my arrangements. But I've written them a note, she said, handing an envelope to Mr. Perinda, who put it in his pocket. No problem, madam, said Mr. Perinda, taking the boy's duffel bag from his mother and placing it in the back of the trunk. Is this all your son is taking? Oh, absolutely, Mr. Perinda. One thing I have taught little Jamie here is to always travel light. There is nothing worse in the entire world than being bogged down with extra luggage. Good point, madam, said Mr. Perinda. The boy's mother, a mousy-looking woman with shoulder-length chestnut brown hair tied back in a neat ponytail, was wearing a flowery cotton dress, and she cradled her son in her arms and gave him a big hug. Now you be a good boy for your grandfather and grandmother, will you? She told him in a stern but friendly tone of voice. Now your grandfather and grandmother don't know you're staying there for a week. I tried to contact them, of course, but they just did not answer their cell phone. But I want you to tell them, sweetheart, that me and your father have gone to Scotland for an entire week. 
We will be staying with my in-laws, your other grandparents in Scotland. That's what I want you to tell them. Tell them your father's brother Felix is getting married to a very nice Scottish girl called Beth Ann, and we're expected to attend the wedding ceremony, and that's why we're going to Scotland at the last minute. Do you think you can remember all that? But what if they don't want me to stay with them? said the boy, his blue eyes growing suddenly concerned. I mean, the last time I saw them, I was very little. I don't even remember what they look like, Mum. They're strangers to me. The woman waved her arm in front of her face, as if swatting away a fly. Don't be ridiculous, Jamie, sweetheart. Your grandparents are not strangers. They'll be over the moon to have you stay with them. And even if you don't remember them, they'll most certainly remember you. Your grandparents have always told me to send you in a taxi to stay with them when we go away. It's a long-standing agreement we have always had, an unwritten one if you like. But they're always at home, so they'll be surprised and very pleased to see you. But not surprised if you know what I mean. The boy did not know what his mother meant. He looked decidedly uncomfortable, being cuddled by his mother. He was getting to that tricky age when open displays of affection in public could be a tad embarrassing for him, especially when strangers were watching. Mr. Perinda saw him flinch. The boy's mother's eyes became more misty, almost as if she was about to cry. She was clearly very attached to her son, and trying her hardest not to show how emotional she had become, to be parted from him. Mr. Perinda could relate to that. He had a daughter who moved to Bangladesh and he missed her desperately. The boy's mother wiped a tear away from her eyes with a thumb, and said self-consciously, What am I like? Oh dear, oh dear me! And my son is only going away for a week, yet it feels like an eternity. Goodbye, my sweet, she said, squeezing her son's dimples affectionately. The boy retracted, pulling away from his mother in disgust. He simply loathed having his hair ruffled up, and his cheeks tweaked. He wished his mother would stop doing that to him, especially with a taxi driver watching. It was so humiliating. The boy's mother handed Mr. Perinda a contact number. That's for my sister in Pennsylvania. Now, she doesn't live very far from us. You can give her a call if you need any help if we're not around. Mr. Perinda tucked the number in his pocket of his chinos and gave the boy's mother a warm smile. Don't you worry, madam. I'll get your son safely to his grandparents. What you say, uh, wisp wind? Whispering winds, corrected the mother. Whispering winds, she repeated. Thank you, Mr. Perinda. I am so grateful, I can't tell you. The boy's father was still standing in the doorway of their home. He called out after his son. Be a good boy, sport. Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Which means you can do almost anything you like, he said with a cheeky grin. The young boy looked up at his father and nodded, and then climbed into the back seat of the taxi, gratefully sinking back into the cool leather seats. Mr. Perinda climbed into his taxi, put his foot down on the gas, and accelerated down the long grey ribbon of asphalt, until the boy's mother was just a speck on the landscape. If the boy was upset being on his own in the back of the taxi cab, his inscrutable face remained as impassively blank as a piece of paper, and very dispassionate towards Mr. Perinda because he couldn't read the boy's expression. He privately wondered how the boy felt about rocking up at his grandparents' home, when they were not anticipating his fortuitous arrival. Back home in Bangladesh, which is situated in the northeastern part of Asia, people were much more nonchalant about that kind of thing, and the spontaneous arrival of guests was as natural and commonplace as finding a leaf that had blown into the entrance hall. An unexpected guest was greeted with great excitement, but here in America, things were remarkably different. It was the coucher, he decided. He found the Americans, much like the English, always liked to make formal arrangements, sometimes weeks or even months in advance. This was the protocol around here, and was considered courteous behaviour. Still he mused himself. The boy's mother had been adamant that his grandparents would be delighted to see him, and would gladly accommodate their grandson for a week. Even so, it did seem a little up in the air giving someone a lift to a destination where they were not expected. It would be like dropping off clients at a hotel where they hadn't reserved a booking. What if the hotel was booked up fully 
Or in the boy's case, his grandparents weren't in. What would he be expected to do in that situation? Mr. Perinda cast those unsettling thoughts aside and focused on the journey ahead. It didn't do any good to dwell on what-ifs. It was much better to just go with the flow of things he found. Mr. Perinda put on some of his favourite Asian music on the radio, while the boy continued to play with his cell phone in the back of the car. He glanced at the boy through his visor mirror. Everything all right in the back? he asked the boy. You comfortable enough? Temperature okay? The boy nodded. I'm fine, he said a little stiffly. It was clear he did not want to engage in any light banter with Mr. Perinda, and the taxi driver got the message loud and clear. The three-and-a-half-hour journey had gone by faster than Mr. Perinda had anticipated it would, as the boy's silence meant the journey should have been a lot more insufferable, but things had not panned out too badly after all. In truth, the journey had been more enjoyable than most. The traffic had not been altogether unpleasant. The roads had not been congested either and there had only been one little bumper bash on the highway on Route 601, which was a great sign as far as Mr. Perinda was concerned. Over the years he'd seen some horrible accidents on those highways before, that had left an indelible memory in his head, that he certainly did not want to entertain. So many of them, too many to count. That's what happened when you drove a car around for a living. You had a bird's eye view of everything that went on, good and bad from drunken drivers to strangers randomly running across the roads, dressed up to look like zombies, giving you gormless grins. That had happened to him once before. He had seen it all. The weather on this very agreeable sunny afternoon had been very pleasant, and the evidence of spring cast her magnificent showery displays all over the countryside, and it was very conspicuous. Trees had been glamorously bedecked with a confetti of blossoms, most especially the magnolia and dogwood trees that were bursting with flowery blooms, as they lifted the countryside out of its depressive gloom into the sparkling, colourful, vibrant potential that spring always boasted. Even the grass had lost its dead, straw-like appearance, and appeared to be looking significantly greener of late. For Mr. Perinda, seeing the landscape reflecting such beguiling promise, lifted his spirits exponentially. He hated the long-suffering American winters, and fully appreciated sunny weather, and as far as he was concerned, the hotter the better. From his windscreen window he could happily see summer was well on her way, and for a man who rather fancied himself as a little bit of a salamander, the thought of a hot summer was a very pleasing thought indeed. Let's just say his dark olive skin had grown significantly lighter over the harrowing cold-hearted winter months, and Mr. Perinda looked very washed out and sickly pale, with his skin having been denied so much sun. He looked forward to regaining his healthy nut-brown glow, which his wife told him always accentuated the colour of his brown eyes. Mr. Perinda had not been altogether entirely honest with Mrs. McKeeley. The last thing he wanted to admit to the boy's mother was that he had never taken any passengers to this part of Pennsylvania before. That would not make him seem desperately professional. It was always important to appear to know what you were doing and where you were going, even if you didn't. His father had always taught him that. You needed to instill confidence in your passengers. Besides, if things were bad and he got really lost, he could always rely on his GPS. Unfortunately, Mr. Perinda's GPS was not behaving itself terribly well. It was not giving him a much-needed signal. Let's just say... Even though the girl in the office who took all the calls for the taxi service had sung Mr. Perinda's praises rather too highly, going overboard by exaggerating the competence of the man to Mrs. McKeeley, she had been informed that if people sounded apprehensive on the phone to give them that much-needed push to persuade them to book the taxi services. After all, it was tough out there, and competition was stiff. In truth, the taxi service was all too well aware that Mr. Perinda, on a dozen of occasions had got hopelessly lost when taking people to their relevant destinations. But that was not information you volunteered to your passengers. The best thing to do was to look as if you knew where you were going, and to secretly cross your toes and fingers and hope you hit pay dirt. Mr. Perinda privately cursed under his breath, but it was safe to do so. As he was speaking in his own language, the boy could not understand. If the boy had been able to interpret the words that Mr. Perinda had been speaking... He would discover that the taxi driver was swearing in his native language, in pidgin English, you could say. 
Sheet, sheet, I'm so feeking lost. Sheet, sheet, I'm feeking lost. It was the first time the boy's voice broke the silence in the taxi cab, and it surprised Mr. Perinda so much so that he nearly jumped out of his skin. You do know where we are, right? came the anxious voice from the back seat. It's just like you just don't seem to look like you know where you're going. Mr. Perinda wondered if the boy had subconsciously picked up on his malaise and obvious unease, as he was sure you could cut the tension in the taxi with a knife. It certainly didn't help that the radio had gone on the blink and was making this annoying static noise. He hurriedly switched it off so that the taxi was now steeped in an uncomfortable silence and all you could hear were the rubber wheels of his Honda riding over the rough surfaces of the road, where stones beat against the rubber and caused the car to wobble precariously, so that the Honda rattled as tiny little pebbles slammed themselves against the undercarriage of his car. If the truth be told, he didn't know where the hell he was, or where the hell he was actually going, but he was not going to let the boy know that. He managed a mock smile, that certainly did not meet his troubled bird-like brown eyes, as he glanced briefly at the boy through the visor mirror. The young boy's face was furrowed in a series of disquieted lines, his back was rigidly stiff, and he looked a tad apprehensive, as his big rounded eyes glanced out of the passenger side window in the back seat. His nose was now firmly pressed against the window pane, leaving behind a sizable smudge. The prepossessing views of the rolling countryside although breathtakingly beautiful, stretched out before them like butter on bread. But they were very much the same. There were rolling hills, meadows of verdant grassland, pretty alpine flowers, ubiquitous trees, many bursting with blossom, and there were dots on the landscape that could be farmhouses or barns, but you couldn't be too sure. It would be easy to drive around in circles and not know where the hell you were going. The boy's mother, Mrs. McKeeley, had been right on the money about that. It was badly signposted around here. And where the hell was the turn-off in the road that was supposed to lead to the grandparents' property? What was it the mother had called the place? Whispering Winds, that's right. Where was the signpost for Whispering Winds? Not to worry, young man. I know where I'm going, he said. I know places around here like the back of my aunt. You could have fooled me said the boy. It looks as if we're very lost. You've been going down this road already three times. We went past that honeydew sign three times. I know we have. I've been counting. Lost, said Mr. Perinda, pretending to sound shocked by the boy's impossible suggestion. No, no, I'm not lost. I tell you, we nearly there, very nearly there. Me? No, Mr. Perinda, I never get lost, never. My mother says it's very easy to get lost around here. And your GPS isn't working, is it? I can't even get a signal on my cell phone. Don't worry, young man. I know exactly where we're going, said Mr. Perinda, in a voice that sounded more like a lamb's bleat, as he desperately tried to disguise his disquiet. To be a good taxi driver, a touch of bravado was essential for the job, but it was getting difficult to see a thing clearly. Everything was becoming significantly darker after the sun finally set over the horizon. It had happened all too quickly, as if the lights of the day had been turned down on a dimmer switch, and now the darkness was rolling in, and only a soft moon was giving him a little light. If only he'd left a little earlier, he'd not be crawling down these remote roads in the dark, playing a rather intimidating, daunting game of blind man's buff. I mean, it was almost impossible to see a damn thing and the whole countryside had been swallowed by a dark hole, and all the trees and vegetation had become ambiguously vague, like an artist's scribbles on a dark piece of paper. On a hunch, Mr. Perinda took a turning at a fork in the road. He did not see any sign for whispering winds, but he was now driving down a long, rather smooth driveway, sighing with relief, and then he saw the stone and wood farmhouse coming into view, and was reasonably confident at long last he'd found the right farmhouse. With a handkerchief, he wiped away the accumulative sweat from his brow. His heart that had increased its pace was beginning to calm down its frantic beats. Well done, old boy, he told himself proudly. You've succeeded to find the needle in the A-stack. You're an exceptional taxi driver, 
a lesser man would never have found this place, he thought, unable to hide the triumphant feeling of self-congratulation that washed over him like a warm glow. Peggy Chester Lewis. Peggy was in her kitchen happily shelling peas for dinner when she heard the sound of car wheels rolling down their driveway. How strange, she thought. She glanced up briefly at the kitchen clock. The time was ten minutes past seven, and it was already pretty dark outside. The furrows between her pale blue eyes crinkled significantly as she wondered who could be paying her a visit at this bizarre time of the evening. They never got visitors to the farmhouse when darkness rolled in, unless they invited people over for an evening's barbecue. She suspected that her husband Hamish was lying fast asleep on the couch, as he would already have gone to the front door by now. Peggy quickly ran her hands under a cold tap, dried them and wiped them against her apron, and then she ran hurriedly to the front door. There was a white Honda Accord parked outside her house, and in the soft illumination of the motion-activated outside lights, she saw a figure climbing out of the driver's side door, wearing an orange turban on his head. The man was going to the trunk of the car to remove a duffel bag from the back, which he retrieved, throwing the strap over his shoulders. She stood very still on the front porch outside the front door, staring with a bemused expression on her face, trying to make sense of what was transpiring before her. For a moment she was too shell-shocked to react. She watched as a young boy opened the back door of the vehicle, climbing out of the back seat. Soon the man with the orange turban was walking towards the front door, carrying the boy's duffel bag over his shoulders, and when he saw her, he greeted her with a big smile on his face. Hello, madam. I think it is a very nice surprise to see you this evening, but I suspect it's more of a surprise for you than it is for me, said Mr. Perinda rather cheekily. You see, I got very good news for you. Very good news indeed. I have your grandson with me. Your daughter told me to drop him off to stay with you for a whole week so you can be real grandparents to him. She said you would not mind. Sorry, uh, what did you say? asked Peggy Chester Lewis. Say that again. I didn't quite hear you. Uh, my name is Mr. Perinda. I'm the taxi driver. I have been told by your daughter you would not mind me dropping off your grandson to stay with you for a week. Peggy almost lost her balance as she stood there staring at Mr. Perinda with wide, bewildered, rather befuddled eyes. She had not heard from her daughter Clara for over twenty years. Her daughter had got heavily involved in drugs that had graduated from the soft stuff to heroin. Clara had bogged off into the sunset when she was only twenty-three years old, with her entire life ahead of her. In the beginning, Clara had been a devoted, fun-loving daughter, but the drugs had changed her exponentially into someone they barely recognised, with sunken, hollow cheeks, dark circles around the eyes, and a frail, emaciated body that looked as if it belonged to an eighty-three-year-old woman. Peggy had been terrified to see her daughter's rapid decline, and had tried to place her in a rehabilitation facility, which worked for a while, as her daughter recovered from her setbacks and thoroughly regained her health, until finally she backslided again, returning to her drugs like a dog to its own vomit. Things took a turn for the worse, when her daughter got embroiled with a young man, who was a serious heroin junkie, and his negative influences over her life made her dwindling health deteriorate before their very eyes. She began to take on the unfortunate appearance of someone they barely recognised any more. She was so stick-thin, it was unbelievable to think that she could actually walk on her peg-like legs. They had been unable to do a damn thing about their daughter's nose-diving health, and then one day she and her husband did not hear from Clara ever again. They had tried to find her by hiring a private investigator to hunt her down, but to no avail. The endeavour had been fruitless, leaving them with more questions than answers. The couple had resigned themselves very sadly to the fact that they'd never see their daughter Clara again, and the pain had hit Mrs. Chester Lewis as hard as a brick across the face. She always told her friends in town that her daughter was living in London in England. It was easier that way, as it would explain why her daughter was no longer part of their lives, 
as she was living abroad, an ocean away, in another country, which of course was not true. It was embarrassing to admit that your rebellious daughter was a drug addict that hated her parents with a burning passion and wanted nothing more to do with them at all, for they had refused at the time to financially support her drug habit. Clara had spoken to her once on the phone, expressing her hatred towards them and saying she never wanted to see them again as long as she lived. At the time of that conversation, their daughter Clara had sounded as high as a kite, and both Peggy and her husband secretly suspected their daughter might have died of a heroin overdose on some obscure park bench somewhere. They'd seen how dreadful she had looked the last time they'd seen her, and doubted their daughter's frail body could cope with much more abuse, for the drugs had sucked her dry. They'd never know the answer to this question, because their daughter appeared to have vanished off the face of the earth. Even the private investigator, Mr. Niles Rolinsky, that they had hired was pretty certain their daughter was now very much deceased. For a woman fitting her description, who had long since been buried in a pauper's grave, provided by the state, had been found dead, having died of a heroin overdose in a seedy motel room, and an image of the deceased corpse, done by a police artist, made the couple very certain that the remains discovered did indeed belong to their long-lost daughter. But now it would seem a new hope was brewing on the horizon. Maybe their long-lost daughter was very much alive, and the police profile of the deceased had not been Clara after all. Peggy and her husband Hamish had huge holes in their hearts, like Swiss cheese, for they missed their daughter desperately, and now out of the blue her daughter had sent their grandson to stay with them for a week. This was the most wonderful thing that could have ever transpired for Peggy. For one, it meant Clara was very much alive, and against all the odds had miraculously gotten her life back on track. Even if she wanted nothing to do with Peggy and Hamish, she had sent her son, their beloved grandchild, to stay with them for a week. Peggy didn't even know that she had a grandson until now. Her heart just lifted as the heaviness inside her suddenly dissipated, like a hot air balloon in liftoff. And for the first time in a very long time, the dreadful, dull, throbbing ache inside her that any long-suffering mother has had to endure over a long period of time had become like a bright, sunny smile for her. When you have hope of any kind, just suddenly enter your life fortuitously. That hope brings so much relief, like a warm, uplifting shower, or like a promising, bright rainbow in the blue sky. Hope invites dreams to be explored and the impossible to become possible, even when for so long your aspirations may seem as if they are beyond you. Peggy's eyes clouded over with tears that she tried self-consciously to fight back, as she studied in the soft light of the evening the figure of her grandson. He was an attractive little boy. Come here, she said, reaching over towards the boy and enfolding him in her arms. It's so good to see you, sweetheart. Peggy would like to have held him for a lot longer, but she sensed that this was not the appropriate thing to do. The last thing she wanted to do was to make her grandson feel uncomfortable. The young boy studied his grandmother curiously. He had no memory of her whatsoever, but then again that was hardly surprising. The last time she'd seen him was when he'd been in a bassinet. She looked to be in her late seventies or early eighties, he thought, but he couldn't be sure he wasn't very good with old people's ages. She was a slender woman with a full head of white hair, white hair that was done in a pixie cut, a hairstyle that seemed to complement her rather small face. She had pale blue eyes and a peachy skin that was rather unlined for a woman of her age, which made her look quite glamorous, he thought. He suspected that when she was younger, she'd been quite a handsome woman. But he was struck by the sobering fact that she bore no resemblance whatsoever to his mother. Mr. Perinda cleared his throat. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, madam, he said, handing the letter in his pocket over to Mrs. Chester Lewis. This is for you. Your daughter told me to give it to you. Mrs. Chester Lewis took the envelope from Mr. Perinda. Her fingers trembled awkwardly. Her breathing seemed to have become quite fast. She read the note and Mr. Perinda noticed a smile developing on her face. She was thrilled. So sorry, Mum and Dad, to do this to you. But I need you to look after little Jamie for a week, 
I thought it would be the perfect opportunity for you to get to know your grandchild better. It's been far too long. Her daughter had not bothered to sign the letter. Jamie's account. I will never forget that moment when Mr. Perinda dropped me off at my grandparents' house. That taxi driver did not know where the hell he was going. He was hopelessly lost. His bravada did not fool me for a single second. But thankfully, on a lucky whim, he managed to find the correct farmhouse, even though he never found the sign for whispering winds. Well, so I thought at the time. I was glad to get out of that taxi. The strong stench of curry powder had burnt the back of my throat and had made my eyes weep. The whole drive it had been doing my head in. Mr. Perinda informed my grandmother that he'd be picking me up in a week's time from their address. He handed her a letter that my mother had written, and my grandmother became very emotional over it. If I was not mistaken, I could swear her fingers were trembling violently when she read my mother's note, but I hasten to say it was a happy tremble, not the kind of tremble you see when someone has received very bad news. On the contrary, my grandmother seemed to be very excited. She seemed incredibly pleased to see me. I had no memory of my grandparents, of course. It was quite awkward seeing both of them for the very first time. It was kind of embarrassing for me, rocking up on their front doorstep unannounced. But they didn't appear to mind in the least. Indeed, they both stared at me with wide, animated eyes, as if I was an exotic species of animal from the zoo that they'd never, ever seen before and couldn't believe was actually real. I guess I'd changed a lot since they last saw me. I looked considerably different to the podgy baby lying in the bassinet. And adults are always surprised when you grow even a few inches, as if they can't possibly comprehend how you got any bigger. They do have a tendency to overreact about natural growth spurts in children, like my Aunt Jeannie. So I'm glad my grandmother didn't say, My, haven't you grown since I last saw you? That would have been a wee bit lame and a tad condescending. This is such a wonderful surprise, Jamie. I'm so thrilled you've come, my grandmother had said, bringing me into the house with an arm around my back. She led me directly into the living room come library, where a man was lying fast asleep on the couch, snoring with a half-open book on his lap. He was reading a Dick Francis. I know because my father regularly reads his work, and I recognised the book at once. Indeed, one corner of the living room was filled with leather-bound books, with gilded titles filling the space from floor to ceiling. New and old, faded and fresh they were. I found myself inhaling the scent of dry paper, wood and leather. It was a very pleasing scent indeed. And then on the furthest side of the room were three large windows that must have overlooked fabulous views. But all I could see was a dark night staring back at me with a soft trajectory of moonlight that washed over the landscape, so that the dense silhouettes of the trees looked ambiguously vague. But their shadowy definitions were conspicuous enough for you to discern what the abstract shapes were. I wondered why my grandparents had not drawn the curtains. The room was beautiful, with vintage red walls and dark walnut floors, and the fabric on the upholstered furnishings were done in deep reds and golds, and there was an ornate chandelier dangling from the ceiling. On the coffee table was a pile of books, a large box of Cuban cigars, and an empty tumbler containing remnants of fine Scotch whisky. My grandmother poked the sleeping man in the leg, and both his eyes popped open. A pair of glasses were dangling off his nose. When he saw me, his eyes widened, as if he had no clue who on earth I was, until my grandmother told him that I was Jamie, their grandson. I could swear his mouth dropped open as wide as a Venus flytrap, and his eyes grew as wide as saucers. He straightened his glasses on his face and said, Son, you come over here. Let's have a look at you. I walked over to him rather anxiously, and he put a hand on my face and stared at me. You are just like your mother, the splitting image, he said. That's funny, I said. Everybody says I don't look like my mother at all, that I look like my daddy. Do they really, he said. I nodded. I'm pleased to hear that, he said in a husky voice. How wonderful, how freaking wonderful. Those were the exact words he used, as they kind of stuck in my memory. He jumped out of his chair, 
threw me into his arms and gave me a big bear hug that was so incredibly tight that for a moment I felt as if I couldn't breathe at all because he'd squeezed the very breath out of me. I could see tears gathering in his bright brown eyes when he looked at me so tenderly and he said to me, It is wonderful to see you, Jamie. Really wonderful, isn't it? said my grandmother. I can't believe it. This is the most wonderful, wonderful surprise. Oh, my word! I just can't believe this. I'm so delighted you're here, Jamie. I noticed my grandfather, rather like my grandmother, was in relatively good nick for a man of his advancing age. My grandmother told me later this was because he worked hard on their vegetable beds and regularly rode his horse Pegasus around the countryside. I think when he was younger he may well have been a very good-looking man. He was over six foot tall, with a very straight posture, and his back was as straight as a pencil. He was long and lean, with a receding hairline that kind of suited his crinkled face. My grandmother's skin was flawless by contrast to my grandfather's, whose skin was crepey and lined. It looked like a leathery road map, and the weathered furrows under his eyes would squish up on his face whenever he smiled at you, so he looked like a wise and tortoise, which was rather endearing, I couldn't help but think. My grandparents had three American quarter horses, dozens of very active free-range chickens, a noisy rooster, and a very old dog called McCluster, who was thirteen years old, but was very friendly to me when he met me, giving me the one sober with his discerning nose. My grandparents told me he was a mixed-breed dog, but he definitely had border collie in him somewhere, as his coat was black and white. My grandparents owned a cat as well. His name was Samson, although they sometimes called him Sammy for short. The cat loved to lie on top of the refrigerator, or hang out on the window sill or porch. He was a tortoiseshell cat with bright yellow eyes, and was initially very wary of me, but my grandmother told me it was because he was not used to children. I remember he watched me for the first couple of nights over dinner in the kitchen from the safe perch on top of the refrigerator, and then he promptly decided he rather liked me. Then he took ownership of me and pretzeled himself between my arms when I went to bed every night. I was very exhausted by the time I finally retired to my bed, after a pleasant meal spent with my grandparents, after my serendipitous arrival at their farmhouse. My grandmother served me so much meatloaf and potatoes which was absolutely delicious, but I couldn't eat at all, so when she wasn't looking, I sneakily fed their dog all my leftovers, and from thenceforth, that dog thought I was like manna from heaven. Reunions with strangers can be very exhausting, and my grandparents were swooning over me like a devoted pair of loving birds over their fledglings. They appeared to be thrilled to have me in their home, and made me feel most welcome. Both of my grandparents were wearing large smiles on their faces, that they simply could not wipe off. I kept hearing them whispering behind my back, I can't believe this has happened. Oh, can you believe it, our grandchild? She sent him to us. Can you believe it? Oh my God, this is the answer to all our prayers. Maybe she doesn't hate us so much after all. This is wonderful, absolutely wonderful. I realised my mother was right. My grandparents were very pleased to see me again, and maybe my fortuitous arrival at their front door had brought them a happy spring to their step. I must confess I was delighted when after dinner my grandmother prepared a bed for me in the upstairs bedroom, which she told me had beautiful views over the countryside. But at that time of night, all I could see were the shadowy silhouettes of the trees and some outbuildings. It was all ambivalent, inscrutable, you could say as you would expect under the faint luminescence of a pearly moon. My grandmother told me the bedroom had once belonged to my mother when she was a little girl. There was a bookshelf in the far corner full of children's books and a couple of antique teddy bears that would be collectible now and could sell for a pretty penny, I suspect, given they were in pristine, almost perfect condition. There were the faint suggestions that the room had once belonged to a little girl at some point in time. But beyond that it was a very well-appointed guest room, with a couple of antique nightstands on either side of an ornately carved 18th century four-poster bed that was covered in very glamorous bed linen, with a bed cover in a peacock green colour that was very flamboyant. It was an attractive room, and my grandmother told me it had been decorated in my mother's absolute favourite colour, 
Your mother always adored emerald green, she said. It was her favourite colour in the entire world. This surprised me, because I thought purple was my mother's favourite colour. But I wisely said nothing. So how's your mother doing these days? she asked me. She's doing well, I said. So is my dad. My words seemed to make my grandmother's face light up like a Christmas tree. She seemed genuinely pleased to hear my mother was doing well. Oh, I am so delighted to hear that, Jamie. You have no idea. Oh, I remember when she was very poorly. We were very concerned about her well-being. But I'm so delighted to hear she's so much better these days. Poorly, I thought. How strange. As far as I knew, my mother had never been sick a day in her life. But being a self-effacing child, I naturally did not engage in much dialogue with my grandparents about that and I guess they realised I wasn't a very forthcoming child, due to my reticent nature, and they accepted that, and thankfully did not give me the third degree, by asking me a thousand and one questions about myself, and about my mother. I hated it when adults did that. I woke up on the first morning in my grandparents' home on two separate occasions. The first one was very early in the morning, when the rooster made that cock-a-doodle sound, and the second time was when a wet nose and tongue were all over my face. I realised it was my grandparents' dog, McCluster, giving me what my grandmother described as an affectionate morning kiss. It was a bit of a shock to wake up with his warm tongue washing over my face like a couple of windscreen wipers, but I didn't mind in the slightest. I sat up with a start, wondering where I was, and then I remembered. I was in my grandparents' house, of course. I felt very refreshed after an excellent night's sleep and my grandmother's bed had been so comfortable. I curiously trotted over to the window of the bedroom, pulling back the long emerald green curtains, and a pleasing soft sunlight filtered into the room. I gasped in wondrous awe at the prepossessing views. The countryside was idyllic. The house was dipped in the middle of the valley, surrounded by undulating rolling hills, and the shapes of the mountains, a faint whisper on the horizon. The yellow grass had become quite green, and there were fields ablaze with colourful wild flowers that were being earnestly attended to by industrious bees and butterflies. There was a scattering of dogwood trees bursting with blossom. I could see a sprawling woodgrove of lofty red maples stretching out over a vast area where they congregated together like old friends. The sky was a cup of blue, and the white brick and stone outbuildings looked very fetching under the subtle light of the morning. I could see my grandmother in the yard, wearing a blue pinafore dress, feeding the chickens that were clucking away happily. I found myself eagerly bounding down the Victorian staircase, with McCluster ebulliently trotting behind me. I wanted to help my grandmother feed those chickens, even if I was still wearing my PJs. Two days had gone by. I settled into life at my grandparents' home, like a duck to water. My grandparents were amazing people and I really warmed to them. I had been fishing with my grandfather, and successfully caught a very small catfish that was not exactly the most attractive-looking fish I'd ever seen, but I felt accomplished after I finally caught something. My grandfather, however, was a skilled fisherman, and the fish he caught was five times the size of mine, and much more easy on the eye. I think he called it a bass. My grandparents introduced me to some of the friendly locals in town, who seemed to think that I was from London in England, and could not comprehend why I had an American accent, which I thought was decidedly odd. But then I concluded that they may have confused me for my father, who has a Scottish accent, and was born in Glasgow. My grandparents took me to their favourite diner, on three separate occasions, where I thoroughly enjoyed the best hamburger I've ever tasted in my life, washed down with a thick, sickly sweet but delicious chocolate fudge milkshake, my mother would never, ever have allowed me to knock back so much sugar, so I was making the most of my stay, and being spoilt rotten by my grandparents. I had ridden one of their horses on the riding trail with my grandfather, an easy-going black and bay American quarter horse called Fletcher, who was so laid back and lackadaisical that you really had to give him a little kick on the side of his flank to get him to move. When you rode him, if he fancied a snack, he would stop for a little rest break, and begin to chew all the grass, and it was quite hard to get him moving again. The horse appeared to always be very hungry, but my grandfather said he was just plain greedy, 
It was on a Wednesday afternoon that I decided to go exploring the Woodgrove on my own, while my grandmother was baking some chocolate chip cookies for tea. She had gone out of a limb for me after I arrived serendipitously at their farmhouse, and had been eagerly spoiling me with all kinds of fabulous fare. She was an excellent cook, which really surprised me, as my mother told me growing up that her mother had been abysmal at cooking. She had made boiled eggs as hard as bullets, and meat so tough you could practically break your teeth on it. My mother must have had a poor memory. Because in truth, my grandmother made my mother's cooking seem bland, very insipid and dull. But I would never tell her that, of course. Go on, Jamie, my grandmother said teasingly. Don't hang around with me in the kitchen like a prize lemon. I know you want to go out there exploring. You forget, I was your age once as well, even though it was a very long time ago. Your grandfather's gone to town to meet up with an old friend of his for lunch. You go off, have a good time on your own. When you're hungry, you can come back, and I'll give you something to eat. I didn't need much encouragement to go exploring, and for once it felt truly good to be on my own. I could taste spring in the air. The weather was pleasantly warm, but not too hot. I was wearing a long sleeve sweater and a pair of khaki pants. The long yellow grass was showing signs of becoming significantly greener. It brushed abrasively against my ankles as I trudged past the stable block and a series of brick and stone outbuildings. I walked through a field and up a slight undulating hill until I reached the grove of trees that were covered in boughs of bountiful red spring blossoms while some of the oakwood trees had sprouted fresh new leaves. The wood grove felt so enchanting, very auspicious, as I navigated my way down the earthen trails, walking across the fertile mouch, created from all the leaf litter from the previous fall. It was a prepossessing day, as an invigorating cool breeze was blowing against my skin, and prisms of soft light danced through the branches, generously warming my face. The quaint bird song was so pretty, but it came from high up in the trees, so I couldn't observe the birds closely. But I did spot some agile squirrels and a few chipmunks darting up branches, regarding me rather curiously through shiny, dark black eyes. My grandmother had told me there was a lovely stream in the wood grove, and I could hear it long before I saw it. The obstreperous vertical trajectory of water flowed rambunctiously through the woods with a resolute purpose as it crashed thunderously against some of the jagged rocks creating a white foamy discharge that rather reminded me of one of my mother's bubble baths at home. The water was freezing to the touch, but I didn't care. I threw off my sneakers and socks, rolled up my pants excitedly, and began paddling in the water. My feet looked so white beneath the surface. I began chasing after little fish that swam past me and throwing rocks into the water, and that was when I saw him. He came bounding towards me in the water, squealing with delight as if he was thrilled to see me and wanted to join in the fun. His unbridled enthusiasm was so infectious. My face burst into a wide smile. He was the strangest boy I'd ever seen. But I guess he was around about my age, although a lot taller than me. But he was completely covered in black flowing hair, like he would see on a gorilla. But this was just a very hairy boy with overlong arms and an unusual pyramid-shaped head. But beyond that, he was remarkably human. I liked him at once. Everything about him was so authentic. There was none of this pretending to be something he wasn't. If I had known then what I know now, I would tell you unequivocally I had encountered a young Bigfoot. But to me, he was just another boy, much like myself. So what if he had tons of hair all over his body? Why would I ever judge him for something like that? I was twelve at the time, and the fact that this hairy boy wanted to play with me was quite wonderful. I could do with a friend. It seemed I'd found one. It was fun to play on my own, of course, but to have a companion like this to play with was all the more exciting, and my idiosyncratic outlandish companion was unlike any other kid I have ever met. He kept pulling these funny faces. He was a natural comedian, who seemed to enjoy making me laugh. So the more I rolled over and spluttered with laughter, the more faces he would invariably pull. Sometimes he would mimic my expressions, which I found hilarious. We splashed water at each other, chased one another in the stream, 
and I cannot remember a time when I had more fun. The hairy boy told me his name was Ilingi, which means spirited one, and believe me, Ilingi had plenty of spirit. He told me names were very important to his people, and the meanings of names significant. So when I told him I didn't know the meaning of my name, he was quite appalled by that. Even though he spoke to me in a strange language, I always comprehended what he was saying. There were no awkward communication barriers between us. A while into our play, I heard a shrill but tuneful whistling in the woods. Ilingi had a dark face, but I could swear he suddenly went pale and became quite flustered. He made me hide behind a couple of rocks with him. She's coming. I don't want her to see us. She'll be cross with me if she knows I'm playing with you. She doesn't like your kind to see us. It was very difficult to contain my giggles as we hid behind a large, sizable rock, trying to be as still as we could. Ilingi kept tapping me, trying to shut me up, but I snorted inappropriately, unable to suppress my laughter. I'm not sure why I found hiding behind a rock so terribly funny, but something had got me tickled pink and Ilingi was not pleased with me, as my ability to hide in plain sight left a lot to be desired. Then there she was, standing over us, like the leaning tower of Pisa, although there was nothing remotely crooked about her gait. On the contrary, she was athletically nimble. It was Ilingi's mother, and she looked far from amused with us. Her posture was angry, as if she was furious with her child for misbehaving. Ilingi's mother was so lofty, tall, powerful, majestic, imposing, and incredibly intimidating. I was gobsmacked by her size and girth. Her body was so powerfully strong, built like the trunk of a powerful redwood tree. For a moment she studied me through her dark eyes, and then she began talking to her son in earnest, in a surly tone of voice, that made me very aware that she was giving him a good telling off but my friend gave as good as he got and appeared to be arguing with her as they pointed to me and finally the mother's dark eyes appeared to soften. Mokolashi! Hakila kwasa! Holona pisa! Okutulono! Akila kwasi! Ipali! Okolomaki! Holono tolua! Then she turned around to me and said, My son likes you. And this time when she spoke to me, I understood the meaning of her words, that like her son's, seemed to magically be translated in my head, but at the same time it seemed so natural that I didn't even reflect over the bizarre interaction I was having with her. She continued, Kila kuso, ha nakisa kasha, ho balinata. He's very persuasive, my son. He insists he wants to play with you. How long are you here for? Just for a few days, I told her. Kulomaki, haki kakwa, lukotolamiti, zina dolobazi. Fair enough, I'll allow it, but don't tell your kind about my son, do you understand? I won't tell anyone, I told her. My friend's mother nodded. Kilatika, hokolakita, shukolamakisa, fakilanakwa, holono posolina, dinakila sikolonompiki. Hatila kuala safan. My friend's mother nodded. I'm glad you're here. My son gets lonely sometimes. And those two people up at the house, they've been so sad for so long. They must be happy to have you around. Be good to them. Their hearts are broken. I read their sad energy. And those two, they haven't been in a good place for many years. Your being here brings them much hope. In the days that followed... I spent the afternoons playing with Ilingi in the woodgrove, climbing trees, playing hide-and-seek, running around the stream. Ilingi could catch fish in the water without any problem. His movements were fast. He was nimble. Try as I might, I could not do the same. Ilingi told me that I was incredibly clumsy. Isn't it funny because at school in gymnastics, my teacher described me as the up-and-coming champion with a great sense of coordination and balance. But to Ilingi, I was so ungainly. I naturally never told my grandparents about Ilingi, as I had promised his mother I wouldn't. But I brought my friend some of the baked goods my grandmother made, 
and Alingi adored the apple pie I bought him. He ate it with such gusto and enthusiasm that was almost orgasmic. He said he'd never tasted anything quite so delicious in his entire life. I bought a piece for his mother to eat, but Alingi persuaded me that he needed a second slice of apple pie, so I relented and allowed him to eat it too. Ilingi gave me a stone in return for my gifts, a beautiful green stone that he told me was lucky, and I still have that stone today, which I keep on my desk. I genuinely believe it brings me good luck. For me, my friendship with the hairy boy was no different to any other kid of my own age, but on the day Mr. Perinda was due to pick me up, I went to say farewell to my hairy friend in the woodgrove. He was so upset to see me go. He hung his head sadly, his shoulders slumped, his eyes misted over. I also wanted to cry, but I held back the tears that gathered up in my eyes. I knew that at home I had no friend remotely like Alingi. With him I had felt as free as a wild stallion to be myself. When I was around other boys my age, I was never as comfortable as I had been with Alingi. It tore at my heart to say goodbye to him. Ilingi's mother wrapped her arms around me warmly. She patted my back affectionately. Tolanisa, thank you for coming here, she told me. Tolomoko, sina twala i gazilono. You've made my son most happy. You've made those old people back at the farmhouse happy, she told me. Don't tell them who you really are. It would break their hearts. Some things are best not divulged. What did she mean by that, I wondered. What a peculiar thing to say. Ilingi's mother looked at me with such a loving tenderness that it made my heart melt like butter. I like you very much, young man. You're a good boy, you are. We'll never meet again. But if you ever need us, just think of us, and we will send you strong energy to give you great comfort. Nitalika, holo pakisa, chwani kalino kolobas, nila vi zanalina. Before Mr. Perinda arrived to pick me up at their farmhouse, my grandmother took me into her arms and said, Jamie, this has been the best, most wonderful week of my entire life. You've brought me so much joy. Me and your grandfather, we are just over the moon that you came to stay with us. You have no idea how happy we've been. Please tell your mum we send her lots and lots of love, and we're grateful that she sent you to us. "'and she's welcome to contact us if she would like to. "'We would certainly love to hear from her again. "'It's been too long.' "'I remember thinking old people were very strange. "'My mother had spoken to them only three weeks ago, "'and they thought that that was a long time.' "'Mr. Perinda greeted me with a warm, friendly smile. "'He took my duffel bag from me, placing it in the back of his trunk. "'Then he opened the passenger side door for me in the back of the car, "'and I got in.' I could sense that Alingi and his mother were watching me from the woodgrove. I knew they were there, so I waved to them. My grandmother and grandfather were wiping away tears from their eyes, and I was choking up in the back seat. I really did not want to leave this wonderful place. I loved it here, and furthermore, I loved my grandparents. Mr. Perinda chuckled as he drove his white Honda Accord down the drive and down the remote country road, and that was when I saw it. It was another driveway, leading directly to another farmhouse, with a signpost which read, Whispering Wind, which I had never seen before. That was the name of my grandparents' property. When Mr. Perinda saw the signpost, he was unable to disguise the shock on his face. He wiped the sweat away from his forehead and glanced awkwardly at me. I knew he was thinking exactly what I was thinking. Mr. Perinda had dropped me off at the wrong farmhouse. He knew it, and I knew it, but neither of us said a word. Suddenly it hit me like a brick to the head. I had spent a week in a stone and brick farmhouse with people I thought were my grandparents, but they were not. But I was not sorry about this oversight or mistake, because the week I'd spent with Peggy and Hamish had been the very best week of my life. I had been dropped off at the wrong location by Mr. Perinda, who clearly knew what he had done and the mistake he had made. I could see the worried expression in his eyes. Don't worry, Mr. Perinda, I told him. I know I spent the week at the wrong farmhouse, and I know the people that I stayed with weren't really my grandparents. But don't worry about it, because I'm not going to tell anyone. I had an amazing week. 
Mr. Perinda looked heartily relieved. Thank you, young man. I appreciate that. I don't know why I never saw that sign. Maybe you weren't meant to. You made those old people very, very happy, said Mr. Perinda. I could see you made them so happy. That's why they must never know the truth, because that would make them very sad. Mr. Perinda nodded in agreement. You won't tell your mother that I made a bad mistake. I could lose my job. It's our secret, Mr. Perinda. It was a good mistake to make, not a bad one. So don't be upset with yourself. Suffice to say, Ilinga's mother's words now made perfect sense to me. Don't tell them who you are. Some things are best not divulged for the greater good. I knew she was absolutely right. I had bought those two elderly people, who were not my grandparents' great joy, because they thought I was their grandchild. So I decided to myself that I would continue to write to them, as they would to me, but I would never tell them the truth. When I returned home, it must have been a week later, when my mother seemed very puzzled about something. You won't believe it, she told me over the breakfast table one morning. Your grandfather has no memory whatsoever of your staying with him for an entire week. I honestly don't know what's wrong with the man. Well, he must be very forgetful, I told my mother. She shook her head sadly. I think he may be getting dementia. Oh, dear, dear me. Poor father. Bless his cotton socks. I can't bear to think he's losing his memory so dreadfully. I hastened to say when I did meet my real grandparents, I was heartily relieved I had not spent a week with them while my parents were away. My grandfather was the most cranky, cantankerous, grouchy man that I'd ever met. When he saw me, he barely acknowledged me and mumbled something under his breath about how annoying kids could be while my grandmother viewed me suspiciously through dark eyes, telling me not to go anywhere near her suitcase because she knew exactly how many chocolate truffles she had in her Tupperware container, and if one went missing, she knew who was to blame. Let's just say I didn't have time for my real grandparents, but Hamish and Peggy would do very nicely indeed. They didn't know they'd been adopted by me, until I visited Peggy on her dying bed to tell her the truth, and she told me she didn't care that I wasn't her real grandchild, because in her eyes I always would be. I hasten to say she left me her farmhouse in her will, and right now me and my wife fully intend to refurbish the place and move into it, as I have the kind of job that means I can work from home. I have no idea whether I will see Alinga and his mother again, but here's hoping. So there you are. That's my story. Dear Sarah, and all your lovely listeners, after spending many hours fastidiously scrubbing and cleaning Mrs. Anna Wingborn's immaculate kitchen, I was finally fully satisfied that I'd done my job well and good. But who was I kidding? Even before I'd started polishing the meticulously clean granite surfaces that had been so shiny that I could practically see my own reflection in them. In truth, this large, grandiose kitchen looked as if it had never been used a day in its life, and I suspected as much. The only thing I ever needed to wash were random empty coffee mugs that would gather around the sparkling Frankie kitchen sink like lost orphans that had been cruelly abandoned. Sometimes there were a few crystal wine glasses smeared with lipstick lying haphazardly around the house, in obscure places like around the rim of the large luxurious bathtub or hidden discreetly under the bed. The odd plate would be found covered with a scattering of crumbs and, of course, the Beatrix Potter china bowls used for the baby's food that always required washing. Why Mrs. Wingbore needed my services for a job that could take her less than 15 minutes to do herself was beyond me, but Anna Wingbourne liked to have a housemaid in her employ. I guess it added to the prestige of being a wealthy New York housewife. I'd been working in her fancy penthouse apartment in the upper west side of Manhattan with stunning views over the Hudson River a piece of prime real estate that came with a hefty price tag for over two years. In truth, the fabulously elegant kitchen looked like something on display in an unblemished show house. It was the crazy and practical size of an Olympic swimming pool with a sprawling marble floor and exquisite islands of gorgeous top-of-the-range granite 
with built-in cupboards that had been superbly handmade and painted pristinely in white. I mean, honestly, does anyone need a kitchen this size? Anna Wingborn clearly did. I do not believe that the navy blue stunning range oven had ever been used a day in its life. I doubted Anna Wingborn even knew how to switch the damn thing on. I'd seen her try to heat up some soup once in a little pot over the stove, and she was completely out of her depth. I had to show her how to turn on the gas hob, and when I was trying to explain to her how to use it, she looked completely befuddled, as if I was trying to explain to her how to figure out a long-drawn-out mathematical equation. Let's just say a self-entitled woman like Mrs. Wingborn would rarely be lost if she had to fend for herself on a desert island and try and cook over an open fire and kill her own food. Even the mere idea would probably horrify her. I often tried to imagine that kind of scenario in my own head, and a huge smile would develop on my face. Not because I was being mean, but it would be funny to watch her in circumstances like that, as I don't think Anna Wingborn would fare favourably. She would be like a fish out of water. She did not have that natural inbuilt survival instinct most of us naturally acquire based on our life experiences. She was so used to depending on others to do things for her. In truth, she had little idea how to manage her own life independently, which was an awful pity if you ask me. I was to learn that she'd grown up in a very luxurious lifestyle, so that since she was a wee little tiny tot, her mother never allowed her to do a thing. She hinted that she had some kind of a lady's maid who dressed her up for school and attended to her every need. Oh, I was so lucky growing up, she boasted to me once very proudly. My mother never let me lift a single finger, never allowed me to ever get my hands dirty. I don't even know how to make a bed, she had giggled, lowering her voice into a low whisper, as if she didn't want anyone else to hear her dirty little secret. In truth, I was appalled by her stunning revelation, for I had never thought in our modern-day 21st century that people like Anna Wingborn existed, but believe me, they do. I've met some of her friends, and they're as spoilt as she is, a unique breed, you could say. It's almost like those glamorous, very wealthy women from the 18th century who grew up with ladies' maids and governesses that you think had died out a long time ago, like the dinosaurs have made their appearance in a select few in our society. Mrs. Wingborn's kitchen boasted all kinds of fabulous accessories, like a top-of-the-range ice cream maker, a navy blue kitchen aid, magi mix, a deep fat fryer, and so many other glamorous bits and bobs that you might well expect to find in an illustrious upmarket restaurant or in the homes of a world-renowned chef like Gordon Ramsay. Everything in that kitchen possessed the unused look as if all the gadgets and accessories had only just been removed from their cellophane packaging, so that the sterile kitchen lacked that lived-in cosy look. It looked as if all the superfilious kitchen gadgets were displayed on the kitchen countertops more for show, as if to pointedly suggest that Anna herself was some kind of domestic goddess, when nothing could be further from the truth, but she could dream, I suppose. Maybe she wanted all her friends to believe she was a great cook. Who knows? I was highly sceptical that Anna knew how to even boil an egg. She was the kind of woman who'd enjoyed the perks of having everything done for her her entire life. The kitchen was a showstopper, and the first time I laid eyes on it, I was completely bowled over by it. For my kitchen at home was so tiny, you could barely swing a cat in it, and my tatty linoleum floors and warped decrepit cardboard-like cupboards were literally hanging off their hinges. They threatened to break apart when you merely opened them and were not exactly very impressive. I doubted Mrs. Wingborn had cooked a single thing in that kitchen. The evidence was so clear to see in her bin, which was regularly littered with the sorrowful abandoned carcasses of leftover fast food cartons from restaurants in the local area, like Chinese noodles, sweet and sour chicken, taglatelli with bolognese pasta, and barbecue spare ribs, the list goes on. When you looked inside her refrigerator, everything was pre-cooked and ready to eat. The kitchen did not possess the things you'd expect to find in a well-stocked pantry, like flour, 
baking powder, cream, cheese, rice, pasta, spices, pulses, or canned goods, which was a dreadful shame because if you wanted to cook in that magnificent kitchen, it sure would help to have some basic ingredients. The one thing the kitchen had was an inbuilt wine cellar that was kept perfectly cool at the ideal temperature and contained some excessively expensive wines. The priggish, rather brash Mrs. Wingbourne was in her early thirties and was on the verge of divorcing her husband George. I could see why. I mean, what man could put up with a woman like her, who had only concerns over one person in her life, and that was herself. Nothing beyond herself mattered. She was the quintessential megalomaniac. In successful marital relationships, people have to learn to be sacrificial, to look out for their partner, for the relationship to flourish and thrive. Anna Wingborn knew not the meaning of the word sacrifice. It was as alien to her as a lettuce leaf is to a lion. From the moment I met her, I knew she was one of the most spoilt people I had ever had the privilege to meet. Before I met her, I did not believe people like her actually existed. But believe me, they do. Greta, where on earth are you? comes the indignant voice as Mrs. Wingborn finally floats into the kitchen, like a yellow butterfly hovering over a field of poppies. As usual, she looks pretty close to perfect in one of her sleek designer creations, of which she has many, far too many to count. Mrs. Wingborn has a dressing room with perfectly colour-coordinated rails and ubiquitous shelves, meticulously laid out and arranged, bursting with the top-of-the-range designer clothes and hundreds and hundreds of designer shoes. Some of them, much like her kitchen appliances, have failed to see the light of day or have even succeeded in drawing breath. The glamorous dress she's wearing today is as yellow as a canary, with a plunging neckline and a pleated full skirt that flares at the bottom, accentuating her slender ankles. On her feet, she's wearing fancy yellow shoes, with an interesting alignment of weave straps around the front of the foot, that I remember admiring in a designer shoe shop a few days earlier in Fifth Avenue but when I saw the price tag, I nearly fainted on the spot. Those shoes cost more money than I earn in a year. The yellow colour of Anna's dress that day was particularly fetching, especially complimentary to her long shiny black hair that fell below her bust, along with her fair porcelain complexion that had undergone hundreds of beauty treatments to keep it looking as smooth as a baby's bottom. She had jars and jars of the most expensive creams you can buy in her bathroom, all earnestly promising to hold back the years. Some of the cream said things on the back like Botox in a jar and skin rejuvenation taking the scientific world by storm. Even though Anna was young, she was pumping her skin with Botox so she couldn't even move her forehead, a fact she was extremely proud about. Prevention is so much better than cure, she had told me. You stop the wrinkles before they make an appearance. It's called thinking ahead. Oh, there you are, Greta, she said in an accusatory tone of voice that suggested that I was not where she expected to find me. Why did you not answer me, Greta? I mean, I ask you, why don't you call out when I'm calling your name? It's terribly annoying when you don't answer me. Very impolite. Did your mother never teach you any manners growing up? Mrs. Wingborn's eyes narrowed stubbornly as she looked at me with a judgmental look that had parked itself on her face that she did not attempt to hide. I'm sorry, Mrs. Wingborn, I apologised. Sorry is not good enough, Greta, she snorted. When I call you, I expect you to answer me. I can't go trotting from one room to another just looking for you. This is a large penthouse, you know, and I'm not an aspiring athlete. Besides, I don't want to ruin my clothes by breaking out into an ugly sweat. Do you have any idea how sweat could ruin the fabric of this dress? And I assure you, a dress like this did not come along cheap. I apologise for that, Mrs. Wingborn. I was just getting ready to leave. I've tidied up, put the washing away, done the shopping for you, collected your dry cleaning... I brought the fragra and the caviar you wanted from that specialised shop. I've put it in the refrigerator for you. Little Petra is fast asleep in the nursery. I took her with me to the shops in her pram. She was very well behaved, I'm glad to say. They all said she was adorable. Well, said Mrs. Wingborn, looking pleased. Of course she's adorable. 
She's a splitting image of her mother, isn't she? The same thing happened to me when I was a wee little one. My mother was always stopped in the street, people incessantly telling her that I was the most beautiful baby they'd ever seen in their entire lives. I gave Mrs. Wingbourne a watery smile. If she was given a chance to brazenly boast about anything, she would get onto her pedestal and harp on about how wonderful her family line was and how it could be traced back to the royalty. I need to go, Mrs. Wingbourne, I said, making a gesture to leave. Mrs. Wingbourne raised her hand in the air, in that same gesture when a lollipop lady at a pedestrian crossing needs you to stop. So I knew she was trying to silence me and prevent me from leaving the penthouse. This was all I needed. I inwardly groaned. Not so fast, Greta, dear, said Mrs. Wingbourne. Not so fast. You can't possibly go now. I've got things for you to do. I need you to stay here. I want you to look after Petra for a few more hours. It's terribly urgent, you see. I cringed as Anna tells me this. My heart sinks into my chest. I work for her six mornings a week. And when I'm not there, someone else stands in for me on my days off or on the times I'm not available to work. A long-suffering elderly woman called Rose Bartlett, who Mrs. Wingbourne finds annoyingly slow. Of course, Rose Bartlett is a very sweet, dear woman, she told me once, but, oh my word, she is so dreadfully slow. But at least she's very good with little Petra, which is why I won't get rid of her. And thank goodness, Greta, that I have you to take care of this penthouse. One of my jobs among many was to supervise and babysit Petra, her little one-year-old daughter, who was absolutely adorable. I had been working for the Wingborns for over two years. What Anna Wingborn conveniently seemed to forget is I had my own life to live, beyond taking care of her penthouse and her little girl. I was doing an online course at Fort Hayes State University Virtual College, an MBA in Nursing Administration as I have aspirations beyond just being an easily exploited housemaid. But how could I expect the likes of Anna Wingborn, who had the hide of a rhinoceros and the sensitivity of a gnat, to appreciate that? The course did not come cheap, but it was affordable, and as far as I was concerned, an invaluable investment to the future, to better myself and to give me greater opportunities in life, beyond just cleaning, cooking and babysitting for other people. Yet in the same breath, I also didn't want to alienate Anna Wingborn. I couldn't afford to do that. I needed this job which paid incredibly well. I really wanted to focus on my studies if at all possible. But Anna Wingborn had made it close to impossible for me, with all her incessant fortuitous demands that were given to me at a moment's notice, without any advance warning. She seemed to expect me to abandon all my plans at the drop of a hat as anything she needed me to do was way more important than any of my frivolous, somewhat facetious studies that she saw as very inconsequential. It had been significantly easier when her husband George had been around, as Mr. Wingbourne was a very reasonable, judicious man, and he would subdue his wife's excessive demands on me by putting her in her place and reminding her that I deserved to have some free time. But now his soon-to-be rather cranky, very opinionated ex-wife had become more and more obstinately disobliging without her husband to rein her in. Unfortunately, I watched poor Mr. Wingbourne walking out of his marriage six months prior with a melancholic acquiescence. I guess he was resigned to the fact that his marriage, like the Titanic, had hit an iceberg and was rapidly sinking to the bottom of the ocean. He was a wise, sagacious man who knew when to walk away from a shipwreck that could not be salvaged. On the morning he walked out on Anna Wingbourne for good, he had been pointing his fingers accusingly at his wife. It was like watching a dramatic scene on the stage of a theatre unfold before your very eyes, with two leading actors who knew how to play their roles to perfection. "'God knows why I married you, Anna!' he lashed out at her. At the time I was washing mugs in the kitchen sink, and couldn't fail to hear the explosive argument between the affronted couple." Anna, I have had enough of your whinging, your whining, your incessant moaning. You're the most self-entitled, spoiled brat I have ever known. You weren't like this when we first got married. But I guess you were showing your best side to me, to persuade me that you weren't remotely like your mother. 
Your father warned me about you. He told me it was your way or the highway. There was no room for negotiation. He wasn't wrong about that, was he? I should have listened to his wizened advice. He said you were as bumptiously overbearing and as difficult as your mother. Two peas in a pod were the exact words he used. He told me why he left your mother all those years ago. She was a nightmare to live with, demanding, self-centred, pretentious, cavalier, snooty, very spoilt. It seems that the apple does not fall far from the tree, does it? I've had enough of you presumptuously making every decision under our roof, without my intervention. Do you have any idea how demasculating it is for me to have you taking charge over every decision in this household? It's an embarrassment, that's what it is. You are so bombastically condescending at times. You make me feel like a naughty boy. I'm a fully grown man, for God's sake. How can I be romantic with someone who behaves like a mother to me? We're supposed to be in an equal partnership, Anna. But I feel you're the one impertinently calling out all the shots, high-handedly saying what's what. In the circumstances, I cannot remain under this roof with you for a moment longer. I love you, Anna, but I don't like you very much. That's a huge problem for me. I feel as if I'm going to bed with my enemy, and my mother conjoined every night of the week. We are always at each other's throats, bickering. Sometimes you are so insufferable, I feel as if I can't breathe. The only thing you care about in our marriage is yourself. You've made that appallingly clear. Even discussing the prospect of more children or a sister or brother for little Petra, and you're whinging about getting a few more stretch marks or struggling with a few excess pounds that you need to lose. For God's sake, Anna, get your priorities right. Stop sounding so pathetic. How dare you? Anna had shrieked like a banshee. How dare you? You don't know what it's like being a woman. You try having babies yourself. See how that would make you feel. My body has already taken a very large beating. I do care about you, George, but I told you I'm not having any more children. If you think that I'm lordly, you've only got yourself to blame for that. If you keep behaving like a silly little boy, how do you expect me to treat you? Now let's talk about this. Don't be so damn unreasonable. George Wingborn strutted past his wife, looking frustrated. His shoulders were slumped, his posture deflated. He looked dog-tired and weary, like a man who'd run a marathon, and finally collapsed from a defeated exhaustion. Let's make this very clear, Anna. This is not about having another baby. This goes deeper than that. You're using your desire to not have a sister or brother for Petra as an excuse. This is about your stinky attitude, your selfishness. You'll be hearing from my lawyers. I want a divorce. You bastard! You bastard! cried Mrs. Wingborn. You bastard! I hate you! Now get out! I never want to see you ever again! How dare you talk to me like this? Don't you worry. I'm going. Mr. Wingborn came into the kitchen very briefly to retrieve his car keys that were on the kitchen island. He looked at me apologetically, straightening his tie that had become slightly lopsided. I'm very sorry, Greta. You didn't need to hear all that. I didn't mean for you to observe our dirty laundry, he said bashfully. Don't worry about me, Mr. Wingborn, I said politely, giving him a sympathetic look. I felt really sad that the couple could not repair and fix up their differences, but I could tell by the determined, resolute expression on Mr. Wingborn's face that it really was over between him and his wife. There was no coming back from this. In truth, he looked like he'd gone through the paper shredder in his office, and he was battle-weary, and his hopes for the future crushed like an insect being pulverised under a stone. I understood why he'd had enough of Anna. For a long time I'd secretly ruminated over how such a nice man could have fallen for the likes of Mrs. Wingborn, whom in my book was probably one of the most unlikable, cantankerous, crabby and difficult women to be married to, as indeed she was to work for. If that wasn't bad enough, she had such exacting standards, and if you didn't measure up, she'd spit you out contemptuously. 
In truth, I'd expected her relationship to fall apart with her husband George, but I never anticipated that her long-suffering husband would be the one that would end things. I thought it would be the other way around. I watched Anna Wingborn standing there in a stunned silence, as she watched her debonair husband in his smart blue and white pinstripe suit, crisp pale blue dress shirt, and shiny black handcrafted Italian leather shoes, march out of his penthouse with a defiant swing to his step and a fiery look in his grey eyes. For a moment Anna looked as if someone had hit her across the face with a baseball bat. Her skin paled, her top lip quivered, her eyes glistened, and her whole body trembled, and finally she managed to compose herself, as Anna Wingborn was good at bearing her emotions. "'Did you see that, Greta?' she said indignantly. "'My husband bloody walked out on me, because I told him I didn't want any more children. Can you believe it? I tell you, Greta, that man does not deserve me. I will make damn sure he never sees little Petra ever again.' He will rue the day he ever walked out on us. You mark my words. I'll make him live with regret. See if I don't. But are you sure, Mrs. Wingborn, that that is a good idea? I said, trying to offer her some well-meaning advice. When Petra grows up, if you deny her access to her father, she could end up hating you. Surely you don't want that to happen. Anna Wingborn looked disgruntled. She almost hissed at me. Excuse me, Greta. I'd like to remind you that you are the housemaid and the babysitter, are you not? Now it's not for you to pass judgment on how I raised my child. If I want your advice, I will ask you for it. I would thank you kindly for not interfering into my personal business. You saw the outrageous dismissive way that George was treating me. Honestly, that loathsome husband of mine does not deserve to see his daughter ever again. My decision is final, and it's not up for a negotiation. Do you understand, Greta? And more besides, what happens between me and my soon-to-be ex-husband George has absolutely nothing to do with you. That was me, well and truly put in my place. I shook my head. "'choosing not to tell Mrs. Wingborn that her husband George "'would likely take her to court over the matter, "'as that man adored little Petra, "'and had just as much right to see his daughter grow up as his wife did. "'In truth, Anna Wingborn did not devote much attention to little Petra, "'even though she considered herself to be a good mother. "'That, in my opinion, was very debatable. "'Of late, Anna Wingborn had been insisting I babysit little Petra.' as ever since her husband had left her she was demanding my services all the more of course i loved babysitting her little girl ever since i turned thirty i had become what some people might call broody i only have to look at a baby and go completely mushy and weak at the knees anna wingborn's daughter was one of the cutest little one-year-olds i would ever seen with bouncy blonde curls and wide blue eyes the kind of perfect baby you would see in a baby catalogue it was always a pleasure looking after little Petra, but working for Mrs. Wingborn certainly was not. But as my old mother used to say, beggars cannot be choosers, and I knew my place. Every day I would walk from the insalubrious train station, that stank of stale urine, back to my time-worn, dog-eared one-bedroom apartment in the South Bronx, where I lived on the seventh floor in a rather decrepit, seedy, disreputable-looking red-brick building. Going home, I'd walk down those unsavoury streets, holding my purse tightly in one hand, and a can of mace in the other, which I kept tucked away discreetly in a pocket with my fingers at the ready, so that I could spring into action if anyone got too close to me, who looked suspiciously like their intentions towards me, were far from good. It had happened once before, when a young man had tried to grab my purse from me, I sprayed him in the face with mace. He rolled up on the ground in a ball, writhing in pain, his eyes weeping and burning. He cursed at me under his breath, as I made my way steadily back home. Obstensively, this unwholesome rough neighbourhood where I resided was at the worst unpredictable, and at the very best unsavoury. I needed to always be guarded, as I lived in the middle of one of the most dangerous, corrupt and sordid neighbourhoods in New York, a dingy, shabby area that was littered with some of the most dubious-looking characters, from drug addicts, dealers, ex-convicts, vagrants, thieves and prostitutes, 
God forbid if I didn't have the wages Anna Wingborn paid me. I could end up living in a scruffy cardboard box on the street corner. And that bodeful, depressing thought always reminded me that I had to be on my best behaviour with Anna Wingborn. I needed to grit my teeth, bite my lip, and appease the woman, because losing this job was not an option for me. Even if I did despise working for someone as capriciously belligerent as she was. In truth, I could not be certain I could get another job terribly easily. I'd been in prison for drink driving once, and was incarcerated for over five years. So with a nasty blight like that against my name, jobs were few and far between. Let's just say potential employers usually did some kind of background check on you, and once they knew you had a prison record, they'd spit you out like old chewing gum on the sidewalk. It was tough going to prison at 21 years old, for having drunk way too much and being under the influence. I had been incarcerated with some terrifying women who were responsible for murder, drug dealing, robberies, violent crimes, and some of those women were a hell of a scary, the kind of woman I never believed would ever cross my path. But once you're in prison, you find yourself mixing with some unsavoury people. I would never have envisaged that I'd end up in a place like this, but like so many things in life, you never ever think it'll happen to you until it does. For the first few weeks in prison, it was all so surreal. In the beginning, I refused to eat the disgusting slop until I grew so hungry that I had to eat it unless I wanted to starve. On the brighter side of things, I should have been thankful for small mercies as I got a significantly lighter sentence than others who've been incarcerated for drink driving. By all accounts, prison gave me a bird's eye view of some of the dangerous people that live among us in our society, who on the surface may seem moderately benign, but are anything but. But many of them, I clandestinely suspect, might have undiagnosed mental conditions, from schizophrenia to bipolar. I was sure of that, based on some of my bizarre interactions with some of the prisoners. One prisoner told me how she'd murdered her boyfriend as he'd cheated on her with another woman. I whacked him over the head with a garden trowel, she told me proudly, with a satisfied smirk on her face. You should have seen him. It was as easy as killing an insect, only I had to apply more force. At the time I was doing some weightlifting, so I was quite strong and in better nick than I am now. It's this prison. All the slop has made me so fat, she had said snortingly patting the rows of accumulative upholstering around her middle. He was begging me to stop, and I said to him, that's what you get for cheating on me. I guess he learnt his lesson, she said. He was unable to cheat on me again. I was appalled that she found what she had done to be extremely funny, and some of the inmates agreed with her, saying that they would do exactly the same to their boyfriends if they had been cheated on. It did not seem to remotely occur to this woman who was called Shelley that she'd be spending the rest of her life behind bars because of what she'd done. She was the female equivalent of a thug, with large muscles, short hair that was spiked on the front of her head, and shaved on the sides. She looked like a woman who was trying to be a man. Her arms were covered in tattoos of ocean mermaids. She had several nose and ear piercings. If I'd seen her on the side of the street, I would have crossed over to the other side, because there was something about her that made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up on end. I don't regret it, she told me emphatically. He deserved what he got. The only thing I regret is I wasn't clever enough to cover up my tracks, because then I might not have ended up here. If I ever got out of prison and did something like that again, I'd make bloody sure I never got caught. If one's going to commit a crime, it needs to be perfect. I mean, look at the Whitechapel murderer Jack the Ripper in London, England. No one really ever found out who he was. It was obvious he was artfully clever. These days, all that is left of the 1800s crime case is speculation. There are over five names they think might have been connected to Jack the Ripper, but they can never be sure. Then more recently, there's the infamous case of the Zodiac killings and the Tyranol poisonings. Those crimes have never been solved, as the people involved in those crimes cleverly covered their tracks. It was tough being in prison with people like Shelley. But when I was around her, I was always sweet to her, very guarded. She seemed to like me a lot, so it was good having someone as tough as her on my side. In truth, I barely remember the collision that resulted in my incarceration. I was so bladdered, I don't even remember the car I was driving. 
or when it slammed into another car with a violent crash. And after that, my memory just goes completely blank. I regret to say one person ended up in a wheelchair on my account, and I had to live with a horror of what I'd done. When I was 21, I had no comprehension of just how dangerous it was to drink and drive. At that stage of my life, I was carefree and self-indulgent, always living in the moment and taking risks that I would never take now. My unfortunate stint in prison was constantly backfiring against me, as no one ever wants to hire an ex-con. And who could blame them for that? Let's just say in Anna Wingborn's case, she'd been too lazy to check out my background, which was a huge relief. I don't even think it occurred to her to do a background check on me. She wasn't the brightest brick in the block in that regard. So when I got the job at the Wingborn Luxury Penthouse at such an attractive wage, I thought all my Christmases had come at once, and I was not going to look a gift horse in the mouth. I knew if Anna Wingborn found out I had been in prison, she'd never allow me to go anywhere near little Petra. Mrs. Wingborn was studying me through her green eyes, which narrowed almost to a squint. I told you, Greta, I need you to look after Petra. Something urgent has come up, she said, examining one of her fingernails very closely, with a frown developing on her face. Although try as she might, it could not make its appearance known, thanks to the stiff resistance of her Botox injections. But I could see the unmistakable annoyance in her eyes. But Mrs. Wingborn, I need to make some time for my studies. I've stuff I need to complete for my online college course. Mrs. Wingborn grimaced. She rolled her eyes in the back of her head, as if she found my comments exasperating. Greta, Greta, honestly, girl, now listen to yourself. Everyone knows that online college degrees are there for our very own convenience, so that you can do the degree according to your own time schedule. So you can put that on hold, can you not, for the time being? It's not nearly as important as looking after little Petra, is it? My little girl desperately needs you right now. You can't possibly abandon her so inconsiderately. I urgently need to attend to this nail of mine. It's in a dreadful state," she said, inspecting her fingernail. "The polish has chipped. It had, but very slightly. It was barely noticeable. I can't possibly go around looking so dishevelled. I must get this nail fixed at once. Being well groomed is very important to me. I need to go to the nail salon right now and sort myself out. I felt annoyed with Anna, but I masterfully hid my feelings. I didn't want to ruffle Mrs. Wingborn's feathers, but her chipped nail was barely noticeable, and in the grand scheme of things, it was hardly significant. For me, important was finishing my degree, whereas important to Mrs. Wingborn was fixing a chipped nail. It's nice to know one of us had our priorities right. Very well, Mrs. Wingborn, I said obsequiously, feeling the disappointment welling up in my chest. I was looking forward to completing my degree. I had enjoyed every moment of my studying, and exercising my brain rarely stimulated me. I would have to put my plans on hold for the evening, and I was getting more and more behind with my studies. It was so not fair, but I knew any protest I registered would have to be internal. I didn't want Mrs. Wingborn to detect any frustration on my part. She would automatically assume that I had a bad work attitude towards my job. And she had a formidable reputation for indiscriminately sacking staff, and how I had managed to keep my job for two years was pretty close to miraculous. I had kept my mouth tightly shut, which had served my interests well. You didn't challenge a woman like Mrs. Wingborn. Thank you very much, Greta," said Mrs. Wingborn. "I knew I could trust in you." She straightened out her dress, picking up her purse as she readied herself to leave the penthouse. "I won't be terribly long." She assured me, "I knew that Mrs. Wingborn was never away for a short time. I suspected she'd be gone for many hours, leaving me to take care of little Petra for the remainder of the evening. It was a shocker to me that Mrs. Wingborn had not even looked in on her daughter Petra when she'd returned home. Is that not what mothers immediately did when they'd been away from their kids for a significantly long period of time? On this occasion, Mrs. Wingborn returned home." Asked me to babysit little Petra, and was off again to paint the town red, without even looking in on her adorable little girl. How could she be so apathetically indifferent towards her child? If Petra were my baby, on the other hand, I would want to be around her as often as I could, 
But Mrs. Wingbourne seemed to find every excuse in the book to get little Petra off her hands at the very first available opportunity. As if on cue the sound of Petra's crying loudly permeated the silence, Mrs. Wingbourne looked at me with a sharp, pointed look. "'Petra's crying! Goodness gracious me, Greta! I mean, do something about it!' she said with a sting to her voice. Like a jumping jack, I sprang into immediate action. I put down the buffing cloth I'd been using, washed my hands very briefly, wiping them on my jeans, and called out after Petra. "'Petra, I'm coming! Petra, I'm coming, sweetheart!' Mrs. Wingbourne abandoned her bright yellow purse on the granite kitchen countertop, and tagged behind me warily as I trotted towards Petra's nursery. I needed to calm down the little girl. I hated to hear her cry. It made me become immediately apprehensive, but Mrs. Wingbourne was muttering under her breath in irritation about how annoying Petra was being. Honestly, ever since I brought that baby of mine back from the hospital, she's been nothing but trouble, always wailing and wailing. What the hell is wrong with her? Mrs. Wingbourne did not comprehend that babies naturally cried, usually when they were hungry or had wet their nappies, soiled themselves, needed some reassurance from their mother. On the whole, little Petra was a very well-behaved baby compared to many. Better than most, I would think. I found little Petra was trying to stand up in her cot, her tiny baby-sized hands clinging tightly to the wooden railing. She was bawling her eyes out. Her cherubic face had grown as red as a field of poppies. Her eyes were puffy, and her pretty blonde curls were smooshed flat against her face where she'd been lying against the cot. Petra was the most beautiful baby, and even when she wailed, she couldn't help but be adorable. Her blue eyes were filling with tears. When little Petra saw me entering the nursery, her eyes widened. She lifted out her tiny arms towards me. Her crying immediately subsided. My presence brought her immediate comfort. I quickly reached out and held her in my arms, picking her up and rocking her on my hip. I found that when I did this, it really did calm her down significantly. I could smell a funny, pongy smell on the wind, a smell I was acquainted with. I realized that Petra had messed up her diaper and that it needed changing. No wonder the little girl was so uncomfortable. There, there, I said tenderly. I am here now. "'Everything's going to be all right, I promise you. "'I'll change your diaper now.' "'Petra began to gurgle happily. "'She grabbed my shirt with her tiny little hand, saying, "'Mummy! Mummy! Mummy!' "'She began to giggle. (laughs) "'My heart sank when Petra called me Mummy. "'I instinctively knew that those words "'were going to go down like a lead balloon with Anna Wingbourne.' No mother would take kindly to hear their baby address another woman as mummy. Even though I couldn't see Mrs. Wingbourne's face at the time, I sensed she was seething and was not remotely amused. When I turned around, I looked at her. She was frozen to the spot and was glaring at her daughter with wide, mortified eyes. She looked quite objectionable. "'I'm not your mummy, Petra,' I told the little girl. "'I'm Greta, remember. Your mummy is over there.' I said, pointing to Mrs. Wingbourne. You see that? That's Mummy. I'm Greta. Mrs. Wingbourne marched over to me furiously, grabbing her little daughter from me. She began holding little Petra in her hands as tightly as if she was a doll. There were daggers burning in her blazing eyes, and the look Mrs. Wingbourne gave me was almost murderous. Her face had grown a raspberry red colour. Petra burst into tears, crying after me and pointing her little hands at me. Mummy! 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 She was bawling her eyes out when Mrs. Wingbourne held her all the more tightly. How dare you, Cretta! How dare you! Look what you've done! said Mrs. Wingbourne, glaring at me. You did this on purpose, didn't you, Greta? I can't believe it! I might have known you would do something like this. You're so scheming, aren't you? You've been teaching my daughter to call you mummy behind my back. You are not Petra's mummy, Greta. I am. I hire you to look after my baby girl, not to teach her to think that you are her mother. How dare you, Greta? Petra is my baby, she growled. I'm the one that brought her into the world. I breastfed her for two whole weeks, I'll have you know. 
and this is the thanks I get from my daughter. Petra was screaming, and on smelling her daughter's pongy nappy, Mrs. Wingborn wrinkled up her nose in abject disgust, handing Petra back to me, almost thrusting her in my hands. For God's sake, Greta, do something, she snapped. My daughter has done something quite unmentionable in her nappy. I simply refuse to take care of it. That smell is foul. How can anything that small poo like a herd of elephants and smell worse than a skunk? Don't just stand there like a prize lemon, Greta. Take responsibility and change her diaper, for goodness sake. Mrs. Wingborn watched in silence as I attended dutifully to her daughter's needs. She stood at the furthest corner of the room, tapping her fingernails on the door. I could tell she didn't want to be in the nursery and was eager to escape the unpleasant stench, but she remained rooted to the spot like a tree. Little Petra lay back on the changing table, wiggling her legs and gurgling. When I removed her diaper, Mrs. Wingborn's face contorted. She looked away as her whole body shuddered, wearing a notable expression of disgust on her face, which left me wondering how many times she'd ever changed her baby's diapers. The whole changing process appeared to completely revolt her. Mrs. Wingborn, I said, looking up at her earnestly, I promise I haven't taught little Petra to call me mummy. I assure you of that. I would never do that. I don't know why that happened. Suddenly little Petra, after I lifted her up from the nappy change to replace her back in her cot, began to tug at my shirt again and gurgle happily. Nanny! 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 That was the final straw for Mrs. Wingborn. She could bear it no longer. Her face grew as white as a sheet of paper. Her lips quivered. Her whole body trembled angrily. She then screamed at me. This is outrageous! Outrageous, Greta! You expect me to believe that you haven't been training my daughter to call you mummy? A baby doesn't just do that. I've had enough of your lies, Greta. Lying through your teeth you are. I'd like you to leave at once. You are fired. I don't want you anywhere near my daughter again. I'll put the rest of your wages in your bank account. Now get out and leave me alone. With a heavy heart and a tail between my legs, I returned to my apartment in the Bronx, wondering how I was going to pay my bills, let alone find another job. I certainly could not rely on Anna Wingborn to give me a good reference. She was out for my blood after little Petra had called me mummy. But was it really surprising, given that Anna Wingborn was very detached towards her daughter? She liked her child as a pretty accessory in her pram. But all the feeding and nappy changing, all the dirty jobs, she avoided like the plague. Two days later, I was languishing on my rather bedraggled old leather couch in my tiny little living room, wearing a pair of burgundy sweatpants and a rather unflattering black T-shirt with a logo on it that read, It's a dog's life, with a picture of a very sorrowful dog on the front, which seemed very apt in the circumstances, because that was how I was feeling. I had not washed my face that morning, and my dirty blonde hair was pulled away from my face in a rather straggly ponytail. I had looked better before, but on this less than auspicious morning, when it felt as if my whole world was maliciously conspiring against me, closing in on me from every side, the last thing I cared about was my appearance. I had managed to recover the leather couch from the curbside several months prior. Someone had thrown it out on the corner of the street because the couch had been ripped on one side. I brought it into my apartment with the help of two teenage boys who I paid handsomely. I found it to be surprisingly comfortable. I had succeeded in repairing the large rip in the leather. My living room merged into my bedroom which had been discreetly curtained off with some threadbare curtains. I did have style and plenty of taste, but with little money my apartment was really on the shabby side, with eclectic pieces of furniture that I'd picked up at bargain basement prices. Still, I'd made it look reasonably presentable for an apartment in the Bronx, and despite everything it had a cosy, wholesome, lived-in look about it. I had painted the walls in colourful colours to brighten the mood of the place. I had chosen turquoise and bright pinks, which looked great against the drab browns of my furnishings. I'd failed to attend to my college studies, when time was at my disposal, to do with it what I liked, but my heart was not in the right place. I was as deflated as a punctured balloon that had lost all its gas, 
Indeed, I was so down in the dumps, after having been fired by Mrs. Wingbourne, that I was feeling decidedly sorry for myself. I found it painfully hard to motivate myself to do anything at all. I had been watching some ridiculous Jerry Springer show on television. I never ever watched Jerry Springer, unless I wanted to feel better about myself, and watching other people screw up their lives made me feel infinitely better about my own. In this show, a young man had been having a relationship with both mother and daughter at the very same time, and they were standing on stage, attacking each other savagely and furiously pulling each other's hair out, while the audience was egging them on and shouting out, "Jerry, Jerry, Jerry!" The mother was missing most of her front teeth and was as thin and dried up as a scarecrow, while her daughter was so rotund that she boasted six chins. And it was bizarrely entertaining watching them wrestle each other with so much contempt. I knew I was in a bad way watching Jerry Springer, as I never watched it unless I was in a rough place emotionally. When I was in prison, the inmates watched it all the time. I guess it also made them feel better about themselves and about their incarceration. I was feeling sick from overindulging in far too much pizza, watched down with an excessive amount of cheap white wine that had given me a throbbing, insufferable migraine headache. What we do to ourselves when we're down in the dumps and down on our luck never ceases to boggle my mind. I'm feeling crap, so let me drink cheap wine at just over three dollars a bottle to feel a thousand times worse. It doesn't make sense, does it? It would seem all that gooey, very fatty cheese from my pepperoni pizza that melted in my mouth, followed by the creamy decadence of far too much Tom and Jerry's rum and raisin ice cream, made the world feel like an infinitely better place. Soothed some of the inflammation of my anxiety and trepidation. Don't underestimate the power of fat and sugar. For a brief moment of reprieve, I could forget that my apartment was based in the most seedy New York neighborhood. I could forget I was now unemployed and had been sacked by Anna Wingbourne. I could momentarily forget how I was going to pay my rent in the future. For a moment, I could live in ignorant bliss, and that suited me just fine. All of a sudden, I heard a knock at my front door. It was not a polite, gentle knock by any manner of means, but an angry, frenzied rap. Naturally, living in my apartment in an unscrupulous, rather immoral neighbourhood, I had to always worry about who was at the door. So I had a baseball bat parked there for quick and efficient access, that I was not afraid to use if needs must. So, armed with my canister of mace at the ready. I clandestinely tiptoed towards the door, making sure that whoever was knocking so furiously hard would not know I was there. I found it was so much better to proceed with caution. I would surreptitiously take a peek through the eye hole and see who the person was standing there before I dared to open the door to them. You could never be too careful. I often avoided answering my front door if I thought the person on the other side looked highly questionable. If there were any advantages to spending a brief stint in prison, I had become far more savvy than most, and was a pretty good judge of character. I knew what signs to look out for if a person could not be trusted. Prison had taught me a thing or two about how to pick out the weeds from the wheat. My heart was thundering impolitely in my chest as the frantic banging continued on my front door. <coughs> Who the hell was out there? And why were they incessantly banging the door? I began to imagine the axe murderer standing there, his face covered with a menacing white Halloween mask, giving me a gormless grin as I opened the door. I could envisage him staring at me blankly, with glazed eyes that were as dead as a fish. Relief flooded over me like a warm shower when I heard a familiar whiny but fractious voice. Greta, I know you're in there. Open the door, please, at once, or I'm going to call the police. I was gobsmacked and taken aback. What the hell was Mrs. Wingbourne doing at my door in my neighbourhood? Could I dare to hope she was here to offer me my job back, because she couldn't manage without me? But if that was the case, why was she threatening to call the police? Would she even do that? What the hell did that insufferable woman actually want? Nonplussed, I reluctantly undid the chain from the back of the door. Which opened with a loud, sizable creak, as everything in my apartment groaned begrudgingly, because all the fixtures and fittings were so ancient. 
Mrs. Wingborn stood there in a black and white striped dress that made her look like a zebra. As usual, she was meticulously turned out, as if she was about to walk down the red carpet at Fashion Week in Paris. Her contorted face appeared furious. She pushed past me so roughly in the doorway that I nearly lost my footing. Where is she? said Mrs. Wingborn. Where is she? Mrs. Wingborn stormed through my apartment like an angry tornado. Sorry, Mrs. Wingborn, what on earth is the matter? I asked. Mrs. Wingborn waggled an accusatory finger at me. Don't act nonchalant, Greta. You've been grooming my daughter to call you mummy. Now you've abducted her from my home. How dare you? Who do you think you are? Coming into my house to babysit with the duplicitous intention of abducting my daughter all this time? I knew when I met you that there was something dreadful about you. I knew when Petra was gone, you were responsible for her disappearance. I should have known from the moment I met you that you could not be trusted. You hear of women like yourself all the time on the news, worming their way into people's lives in order to abduct their kids. You're not going to get away with this, Greta. You're lucky I haven't called the police yet. Now, where is she? What are you talking about, Mrs. Wingborn? I don't understand what on earth you're talking about. I'm not fooled by you for a minute, Greta. Don't think I'm not. I slipped out of my home a moment ago just to buy something at the Delicatessens. And when I returned, Petra was gone. I knew you took her. I'm not stupid, Greta. Mrs. Wingborn, I did not take Petra. Shouldn't you be calling the police? I assure you I have nothing to do with your daughter's abduction. But if she's gone, this is deadly serious. I promise you I had nothing to do with her disappearance. You can search this house if you like. I would never do something like that. I may be many things, Mrs. Wingborn, but I am not a child abductor. You'd have to be seriously sick in the head to do something like that. Liar! Look at you! Such a dreadful liar, Greta! said Mrs. Wingborn, growling at me contemptuously and marching through my home like a trumpeting elephant with a very large axe to grind. Who knew a woman of such slight stature could bring such devastation to my little apartment? But believe me, she did without apology, as wooden floorboards vibrated and creaked, and clothes were flung from one end of the room to another. Where is she? Where is my daughter, Greta? Mrs. Wingbrawn shrieked, while I stood in my apartment bemused and frozen to the spot more from shock than anything else. But by the time Mrs. Wingborn had fully searched my apartment, even the salt and pepper cellars in my kitchen cupboards were now lying in a broken heap on the floor, along with some smashed china plates that Mrs. Wingborn had just thrown indiscriminately on the floor in her heated rage. Never mind the fact that those china plates were rather special to me. That wouldn't have occurred to Mrs. Wingborn. Mrs. Wingborn threw open my cupboards, rifling through my clothes like a woman possessed, leaving my place looking like a bomb had hit it. She looked in the most ambiguously obscure places for her baby. That was almost laughable, but when you're desperate, you can do the strangest of things. I knew that only too well. When I was a child and my kitten had vanished, I looked for it in the freezer, the dishwasher and washing machine. I don't understand, Greta, she said her voice becoming fainter and fainter. I was so sure you had taken her. Where could she be? Are you hiding her? Please tell me. I need to know. If you don't tell me the truth, Greta, I'm going to call the police. But we don't need to do that if you're perfectly honest with me. Mrs. Wingborn opened up her purse, pulling out a checkbook and a pen. Now I won't go to the police at all. I won't get them involved, Greta. If you give me little Petra back, name your price and I'll write you the cheque. Will a hundred thousand dollars do? Please be reasonable, Greta. Petra is my baby. Mrs. Wingborn, calm down, relax. I promise you I have not taken Petra and I don't want your money. Sit down there on the couch and I will make you a sweet cup of tea and we can talk about this properly. I am sure you will find, Petra, there must be a rational explanation for her disappearance. I mean, think about it for a moment. Could anyone else innocently have taken her out? It's very unlikely she has really been abducted. Mrs. Wingborn calmed down, but her face remained white like a sheet, 
when I finally handed her a cup of sweet tea. She took a couple of grateful sips and began to shake quite violently. What am I going to do, Greta? Oh, Petra has gone, she said with wide eyes that were filling with tears. Someone has stolen my baby. What am I going to do? My poor little Petra. Someone could be harming her right now as I speak. But are you sure, Mrs. Wingborn, that little Petra really has been abducted? Tell me what happened from start to finish. Let's try and figure this out together, shall we? I mean, there are surveillance cameras at the penthouse. I'm sure they'd have picked up any images of anyone entering the building. Oh, I hadn't thought of that, said Mrs. Wingborn, opening her purse to retrieve a tissue. She blew her nose hard and mopped her eyes, her face brightening. Whoever took my baby, they'll be on the CCT footage. They won't be able to get away with this. I'll make sure they don't. Let's see, she said, trying to slow down her thoughts. Well, that very unreliable woman I hired the day before yesterday to take your place. She never turned up for her job this morning. Can you believe that? So unreliable. She worked for me yesterday, demanded payment and bogged off. I got a sneaky suspicion she wasn't coming back. I'm always very discerning about that when it comes to people, you know. I could tell she was a bit slapdash. I told her over a hundred times to clean the granite surfaces. She told me they were already sparkling and she wasn't going to do them. Can you believe her brazen rudeness? I told her she would do as I told her to do. And well, you know, she became quite sulky. I could tell she was very lazy. As that woman didn't turn up this morning, I had to look after Petra myself. But I slipped out of the penthouse for just a few minutes, and when I returned, she was gone. She wasn't in the cot. She wasn't where I left her. No one had broken into the penthouse, and only you, Rose and George, have a key. So I thought... You thought I'd taken Petra? Mrs. Wingborn nodded sheepishly. Mrs. Wingborn, could not your ex-husband George have taken her? You've just said he has a key to the penthouse. Or maybe Rose turned up and took her for a stroll in the pram. It's not Rose. No, she's away at the moment. Oh, my dear Greta, you may be right. George might have taken little Petra. I'll kill him, she growled. I will bloody kill that man. He has no right. It's him. I know it is. He's stolen the baby. Calm down, Mrs. Wingborn. If George has taken little Petra, well, Petra is his child as well. It's important for you not to overreact. Let's give him a call, shall we? Give me your cell phone. I'll make the call for you. Mrs. Wingborn awkwardly rifled in her black and white striped purse, handing me her cell phone. Her fingers were shaking so much. I doubted she'd be able to click on to the right number, even if she tried. She wasn't in a position to do anything. She was such a gibbering wreck, like someone who's had a dreadful shock, which is exactly what she had had. I scrolled through her contact numbers and pressed George's number and put the call on speakerphone so that Mrs. Wingborn could listen in. Hello, came the distinguished baritone voice of Mr. Wingborn. Hello, Mr. Wingborn. This is Greta speaking. Greta Patchouli. I do hope you're doing well. I worked for you at your penthouse on the Upper West Side. Do you remember? Before you and Mrs. Wingborn parted your ways. Oh, hello, Greta. Now, this is a pleasant surprise. I didn't expect to hear from you. I do understand that Anna let you go. I'm very sorry about that. You're one of the best babysitters we've ever had. And you kept the apartment of ours spotless. If you want a reference, I will be very happy to give you one. If that is what this is about, it would be my pleasure. No, Mr. Wingborn, I'm not phoning you for a reference. But if you're offering, I would appreciate one. No, it's your wife. She's here with me at my apartment in the Bronx. It would seem she's worried because little Petra has gone missing. She was under the impression I had taken her. She's worried about the whereabouts of little Petra. You haven't seen her, have you? Why on earth would Anna think you've taken our baby? Honestly, she can have some weird ideas in her head at times. No, Petra is not missing. I left a note for Anna on the kitchen refrigerator, telling her I've taken Petra out for the day. 
When I got to the penthouse, Petra was all on her own. She needed her nappy changing, and I made a bottle for her. Petra was quite hungry. I waited for Anna, but she was out for a very long time. So I left her a note and took Petra myself with some nappies and formula. I couldn't leave our baby unattended, as you can fully appreciate. That would make me a very irresponsible parent. I cannot think why Anna left poor little Petra all on her own. When I entered the penthouse, little Petra was howling. She was very distressed. She needed her mother. How dare you, George? Mrs. Wingborn cried out. How dare you? I thought Greta had stolen my baby. And all this time it was you who snatched little Petra out of her little bassinet. Do you have any idea how worried I've been? I've been going out of my mind here. And you are acting so indifferently, as if it's no big deal. How could you do this to me, George? How could you do this? Correction, Anna. Petra is not your baby. She is our baby. You would do well to remember that. I left you a note, Anna, in the kitchen on the refrigerator to tell you I had Petra with me. If you troubled yourself to look a little better, you would have observed the note. It was very clear to see. I'm sorry, but I have as much right to see Petra as you do. She's my daughter as well. Do you want me to go to court and report that you left our baby unattended on her own in the penthouse? While you waltzed off probably to get your toenails done if I know you. If you want things to get messy, Anna, I'll make sure they do get messy for you. And I'll make your life a living hell, if needs must. I will do what I need to do to get custody rights. You haven't allowed me to see my baby for two months, and that is completely unreasonable of you. My parents are devastated not to have seen their grandbaby. You cannot do this to them or to us. It's unacceptable. So I'm going to be straight with you, Anna. So this is the score. I've already consulted lawyers. Wait until they hear you left our baby unattended. I could end up getting sole custody rights. How do you want to play this, Anna? If you want to play hardball over this, I'm game for that. But you could end up losing everything. And I'm sure you're sensible enough not to risk playing Russian roulette with our child. Do you want to be reasonable with me and share custody of our daughter? Do you want to risk losing Petra to me so that I have full-time custody of her? I'm prepared to be reasonable, provided you agree to allow me to spend time with my little girl. That is all I'm asking. I don't like your insinuations, George. They're not very kind, nor are they tactful. You're making out I'm a terrible mother and am unreliable and cannot be trusted to look after my little girl. I'll have you know I'm a very good mother and I only went out of the penthouse for a minute. That was all, said Mrs. Wingborn with a contemptuous snort. You're implying that I'm a dreadful mother, and I can't have that. I cannot accept that. You may have meant to go out for a minute, Anna, but you probably got distracted. You were gone for considerably longer than that, and you know that. I know that. I had time to make her a bottle of milk, change her nappy, read her a story. I've taken footage of the apartment and how I found her all on her own in her cot and I will use it in court if I need it. Mrs. Wingborn let out a resigned sigh. All right, George, I get the message, I rarely do. If you're happy, you win. We'll share custody rights of little Petra, but I would like my baby back as soon as possible, or I will not hesitate to call the police. Do you understand? You need to return her now. I'm glad, Anna, you're finally seeing sense, said Mr. Wingborn. It's in the best interests for our child to see both of her parents. You heard me, George. I want little Petra back very soon at my penthouse, or there will be trouble to pay. I understand loud and clear, Anna. I'll be dropping her off in any second. I should think so. 
How dare you take her like that without even consulting me? Have you ever heard of a phone before? I had my cell phone available. Why didn't you phone me instead of leaving a note on the fridge? How can you do that? Look, let's not go there, Anna. We need to be grown up about this and not be at each other's throats all the time. It's not good for little Petra. She can't see us behaving like this. Now I will drop little Petra off at the penthouse. You'll be seeing her shortly. There we are, Mrs. Wingbourne, I said once the phone call had been disconnected. Didn't I tell you all would be all right? At least you know Petra is fine and she's with her father. Your husband adores that little girl. And it's good, isn't it, having someone else taking responsibility for her from time to time? Being a single parent is hard work. It's nice to be able to share out the load. Mrs. Wingbourne ignored my words. I knew I should have changed those bloody locks. I don't know why I didn't do something sooner. You and my ex-husband both have keys to the penthouse. You never gave your keys back to me, did you, Greta? It was hardly a wonder I thought you'd taken Petra. I mean, what was I supposed to think? Mrs. Wingbourne, I love little Petra very much. I assure you of that. But I would never abduct your baby. That would be an insane thing for me to do. And the last thing I would want is to go to prison for child abduction. You're a good girl, Greta. I should have never fired you like I did. Perhaps I did overreact a little. What was I thinking? I was just so upset that my little girl called you mummy. I mean, how could she betray me like that? It really broke my heart. Do you have any idea how hurtful it is to hear your own baby girl call somebody else mummy? One of my girlfriends was very distressed when her baby's first words were dada. But I assured her dada is a lot easier to say than mama. But a baby calling her babysitter mummy, well, that's the worst thing. I know it's upsetting, Mrs. Wingbourne, but I assure you I never encouraged little Petra to call me mummy. I honestly don't know why that happened. Mrs. Wingbourne sighed. You know what, Greta? I wouldn't normally do this, but I'm going to offer you your job back on a trial basis only. Do you understand? If you upset me any more, I will have to ask you to leave. I would appreciate it if you could teach my little girl not to call you mummy. It's highly inappropriate. Goodness gracious, if any of my girlfriends saw that happening, they would think I was an atrocious mother and that my baby preferred the nanny over me. We can't have that, can we? Absolutely not, Mrs. Wingbourne. I'll do my very best to teach little Petra what's what. And yes, I would love my job back. Thank you very much. Good, I'm glad to hear it. At least you know what side your bread is buttered, Greta. She paused for a moment and said, I just need to inform you, Greta. We are going to spend a couple of weeks at the Oregon coast. And when I say we, I mean my best friend Beatrice, Little Petra, and you, of course. I will pay you handsomely, given I will need you on board full time to take care of the place, to clean, to shop, to cook meals, and to look after Petra. I just feel I need a break. I'm utterly exhausted after all the shenanigans with George. Goodness gracious, that man has worn me to a frazzle. New York, well, it has a way of draining you, does it not? Beatrix suggested we went away together. And I think it's a great idea of hers. It would mean that you will have to avoid doing any of your college work. Put that on hold for a while, will you not? Your attention needs to be devoted to little Petra, of course. I will give you some time off to enjoy the private beach on the property. Although it's not entirely private, if you know what I mean. How does that suit you? Sounds perfectly lovely, Mrs. Wingbourne. I said, my heart leaping with delight. I wanted to cry out from the rooftops, I've got my job back, I've got my job back, I've got my job back. Instead, I kept my feelings to myself and was very polite to Mrs. Wingbourne. And honestly, Greta, said Mrs. Wingbourne, looking around disapprovingly at my apartment. The Jerry Springer show on television? You've got to be kidding me. Don't tell me you watch such riffraff. Look at this living room of yours. It looks like a doss house in here with pizza boxes and Tom and Jerry tubs of ice cream everywhere. I'm glad you don't treat my penthouse like this, because you wouldn't have a job if you did. I honestly don't know what happened here, Mrs. Wingbourne, I said bashfully. 
as I stared at my appalling mess, where cartons of Tom and Jerry ice cream lay on top of the coffee table with a spillage of cream on the side, and there were two empty pizza boxes standing next to the ice cream tubs, covered in grease. Had I really eaten three tubs of ice cream? I was realising what a slob I'd been. I think I was just a little down on myself, Mrs Wingborn, after losing my job with you. I kind of eat pizza and ice cream when I'm depressed. And for the record, I never watch Jerry Springer, Mrs Wingborn, I lied. I think the television just channel hops. Oh, I am relieved to hear you say that, Greta. I need my daughter to have positive role models in her life, as you will appreciate. Three days later, I should have guessed that Anna Wingborn would only ever choose the most extravagant and exquisite seafront property on the Oregon coast, to book her holiday, which boasted its own helipad. I shouldn't have expected less from a self-indulgent woman like her, with exacting standards. The three-storey glass and steel minimalistic square building was a prime example of modernist architecture, and its geometric angles were pleasing on the eye. By all accounts, on this stretch of the craggy, somewhat wild, untamed, rugged coastline, there was only a scattering of other grandiose homes, all enjoying the privileges of private beaches that may not have actually been private, but were as good as so, as the beaches were quite inaccessible to the public, unless you wanted to trespass across somebody else's property to get there. The beachfront property was called the Dreamcatcher House. It was avant-garde with cutting-edge 21st century designs, where seamless walls of glass on two levels overlooked the most exquisite ocean-front views. You could stare out at the aquamarine water, where the stiff, rigid and unyielding sculptural rocks offered their voluptuous artistic arrangements to frolic among the ocean spray, while the blue sky would perform evening theatrical productions by casting the most fabulously prepossessing golden sunsets over its whole expanse. Clearly, it was maximising these glorious views, That's what the architect had in mind when designing this high-tech creation. The house boasted swanky furniture that had been tastefully arranged and fastidiously coordinated to look relaxed, elegant and cosy, to give that lived-in appearance. The bright works of contemporary art complemented the luxurious large couches bedecked in sumptuous cushions. The rooms were all fashionable, airy and spacious, with large modern fireplaces and marble mantels. The trendy furnishings throughout possessed different textures and styles, made of glass, marble, wicker and sometimes wood. The rooms flowed into each other seamlessly, as if the walls between rooms did not exist. There was an elaborate in-vogue kitchen, which opened out onto a large patio with exquisite seafront views. The O'Corrent Dreamcatcher home was comfortably nestled on top of a large mountainous outcrop, There was a modernised, innovative staircase of iron embedded into its side, which led directly down to the beach, where a ribbon of golden beach sand stretched out before you, and there were little islands of sculptural rocks, and fringing the beach sand like a verdant wall was an extensive wood grove boasting a vast congregation of mature Douglas firs, red maples and Oregon ashes. It was June and the weather was warm and pleasant and it would seem Anna and her best friend Beatrix spent ages on the beach sunbathing together. Neither of them swam as the current was rough and the temperature of the water ice cold, but both women went sauntering onto the beach like a couple of fashion models, sporting designer swimsuits, fancy sarongs, wide-brimmed sun hats and Gucci sunglasses, and they would take along with them an ice box full of French champagne and a good book to read on the beach. They would both return from the beach smelling of coconut oil, with skins flushed not only from the sun, but from the drink they'd enjoyed. They were clearly half-cut, as the effervescent champagne, along with the sun, had gone straight to their heads. I spent my time polishing surfaces, cooking for Anna and her friend, and watching over little Petra. I was clandestinely wondering when I'd get an opportunity to enjoy the beach, as Anna had failed to give me any time off. Still, I couldn't complain. I had my job back, didn't I? And just being here at the Oregon coast and thoroughly enjoying these seafront views was a pleasure for me to behold. But I was secretly longing to run across that beach sand and dip my feet in the icy cold sea spray.
Anyway, it was way better being here than being stuck in Mrs. Wingbourne's Upper West Side penthouse in Manhattan, as lovely as it was. I had taken the opportunity to walk with Petra around the quirky little town in her pram, where I visited some rather eccentric-looking shops. I had picked up some supplies to take back to the house, a list of excessively extravagant items that Mrs. Wingbourne had ordered me to get, from black truffle oil to black ink pasta, that I would be expected to cook for dinner that night. But thankfully I was a dab hand in the kitchen, and Mrs. Wingbourne appreciated my cooking. Growing up, my father had been a chef, so I'd picked up a few pointers from him, and I could make some mean dishes. One morning, when both women came back from the beach, they were so drunk and giggling like two little school kids, claiming someone had been spying on them while they were sunbathing, and had showered them with little shells. They appeared to think it was terribly funny. I, on the other hand, thought the alcohol had gone straight to their heads, and that they had dreamed up the event. It seemed unlikely that anyone would have showered them with shells, but the two women were adamant it had actually happened. Furthermore, they claimed they'd seen the largest footprints in the sea sand that were easily 30 centimetres in size. I hasten to say I did think they were exaggerating about that. It's amazing how large things can become when you're intoxicated. And when Mrs. Wingbourne was drunk, everything in her world became wonderful, including me, which did make a change. You should have seen us, Greta. Oh, my word, said Mrs. Wingbourne. We went to the beach, didn't we, didn't we? And we saw these footprints. Oh, my word, they were enormous, ginormous, massive feet, massive. Someone was trespassing on the beach. I mean, I ask you, who has feet that size? Beatrix nodded. The feet were huge, she giggled. Anyway, continued Miss Wingbourne, we were sunning ourselves, enjoying our champagne. And would you believe it? We heard someone whistling. It was incredible, agreed Beatrice, hardly being able to articulate her words she was so drunk. How many glasses of champagne had both the women drunk? They could barely stand on their legs that were crumbling beneath them. But who was I to judge? I was the housemaid after all. It wasn't for me to critique the woman I worked for nor was I to pass commentary on the behaviour of her friend. The whistling. Oh, that was really good, wasn't it? It was really good, wasn't it, Anna? Said her friend, hiccuping. Oh, I wish I could whistle like that, said Mrs Wingbourne. Anyway, I have no idea why someone was out there on the beach today. I mean, it's private property, isn't it? I'm not sure it is a private beach, Mrs. Wingbourne, I reminded her. It seems like that because it's not accessible to the public. But my guess is if someone wanted to hang around on that beach, they could. Most of the beaches in Oregon are public, although I think there are over 150 privately owned beaches. That's what I heard anyway. I stand to be corrected, of course. Well, someone, they were spying on us, weren't they? Said Mrs. Wingbourne, giggling. We were on the far side of the beach, close to the wood grove. Someone was showering us with shells, weren't they, Beatrice? We heard them snorting, as if they were trying to suppress their laughter. We tried to find out who was throwing the shells at us, but there were so many trees fringing the boundaries of the beach. We couldn't see a damn thing. Hell of a shame, wasn't it, Beatrice? Someone was out there, hiding behind the trees, I suspect. They were trying to scare us. But I don't scare easily. Neither does Beatrice. Do you, Beatrice? Beatrice nodded in agreement. Someone was watching us. Even before they threw shells at us, they were watching us. You could feel it. I had wrinkles at the back of my neck. I could hear deep breathing. Like those weirdos on the phone that breathe heavily down the line. Whoever was messing around, they were trying to intimidate us. I mean, honestly, they were playing games at our expense, weren't they, Anna? Anna nodded in agreement. It was probably a kid just having a laugh, I said. 
I mean, one of the houses along the stretch of beach might actually be hosting a family of kids. It wasn't a kid, said Beatrice insistently. Not that kind of energy. I don't know if a kid could breathe like that. Someone was trying to scare us. Look at you, Greta, said Mrs. Wingborn, slurring her words. Oh, I'm so drunk. I can hardly string a straight sentence together. You've been working so hard in the house, Greta. Why don't you go down to the beach with little Petra? It's such a lovely day out there. You shouldn't spend your day cooped up in here with us. It's a waste of time. When you're by the coast, you should be out there on the beach. Thank you very much, Mrs. Wingborn. I'd like that very much. I think I'll do that. Well, what are you waiting for, Greta? Don't stand there. Get out there with little Petra. Have a great time. Both women were slouching on the couches in the living room, and I suspected it wouldn't be long before they fell fast asleep. Anna Wingborn's eyes were practically closing. I did not need much encouragement. Mrs. Wingborn could be very agreeable when she was drunk. It was like when she was tipsy she underwent a major character metamorphosis from grouchy and crabby to very sweet, carefree and easy-going. Hallelujah! The woman was actually being nice to me. I hurriedly grabbed a beach bag, a towel, a portable mobile playpen, especially designed for the beach, and thankfully it folded up easily and fitted into the beach bag. I hurriedly made my way out of the square-shaped glass building, running down the steel inbuilt steps of the mountainous hill to the beach below. Little Petra's legs were wrapped around my right hip, and the canvas straps of my beach bag slung over my left-hand shoulder. Petra was gurgling away happily, oscillating her tiny arms around excitedly. She might have only been a tiny tot, but she seemed greatly appreciative of the fresh sea air, and responded happily to the pleasant feeling of the warm sun gently caressing her fair skin. It was such an exquisite day. The sky was a cup of blue, without a fluffy white cloud in sight. The temperature was idyllic, not too hot, not too cold. I think it was in the late sixties or seventies. The frisky ocean with the foaming white waves crashing thunderously against the rocks was really quite exhilarating. I stood there for a moment, absorbing the prepossessing views. I thought I'd died and gone to heaven. I could taste the sea salt on my tongue, and an invigorating spirited breeze punnelled me so that my t-shirt whipped against me like a large white sail. I threw my flip-flops haphazardly off my feet and allowed the slightly warm sea sand to massage my feet. The coarse, tiny granules brushed against my skin like an exfoliating but gentle sandpaper. I ran across the long ribbon of sand to the far end of the beach towards a large congregation of sculptural rocky outcrops which closed in the beach like a retaining wall. Further back from the beach were the tall, lofty trees that stretched out before me like a sizable yawn. It was not the kind of wood grove easy to navigate, as you might lightly be grabbed by some indiscriminate angry roots that jutted precariously out of the ground and were eager to trip you up, or low-slung tree branches grabbing you by the shirt like a large pair of hostile arms. I threw down my canvas beach bag. It plopped to the ground with a thud, allowing the sunblock, the baby cream and the baby's bottle to spill out onto the beach. I placed little Petra gently on the sand, while I arranged my beach towel on the ground, where I was intending to sit. Finally, I set the playpen up with pegs that sank into the sand so that little Petra would be safely contained behind its little walls. Petra continued to gurgle with delight, giggling and making appreciative sounds. She was lifting the sand up in her tiny little hands, and her cherubic face was flashing me the cutest smiles. She was in heaven. I could leave her there for a few minutes while I went to explore the rock pools and dip my toes in the water. I'd keep a beady eye on Petra, but given we were all alone on the beach, I knew she was safe in her playpen. I massaged some sunblock into her face. I was sure she'd enjoy playing in the sand. Suffice to say it would be remiss of me not to keep my eyes on her at all times. I was dying to dip my toes in the water, to explore the rock pools that lay beyond. I was fascinated by sea creatures of every kind and was particularly intrigued by starfish and sea anemones. I ran eagerly towards the seawater and let out a delighted whoop, rather like a child, while the seawater went rushing over my feet like a gentle ice-cold caress. The water was freezing to the touch. 
even though it was a lovely warm day, but I didn't mind. I glanced back briefly at little Petra over my shoulders. She seemed to be quite happy in her playpen, frolicking around in the sand to her heart's content. Now was my quintessential opportunity to examine the rock pools more closely. There were so many sculptural rocks jetting out at the edge of the beach, and I began to amble over them, examining every rock pool I could find. I found one full of so many interesting sea creatures, and a little octopus that was squirting black ink. I don't mind admitting to you, I lay on the rocks on my tummy, staring down at the pool below, utterly mesmerised, completely enchanted. Time stood still, as if the hands of the clock had been held back. I forgot all about Petra. I'm not sure how long I was on the rocks, but then I suddenly rose to my feet, ambling quickly towards the little girl. In the distance I could see two ambiguous, tall but vague silhouettes standing over Petra's playpen, peering in at her. What the hell? Were there two people about to abduct Petra? I wondered. Oh my God, please no, please no. I had foolishly failed to attend to her every need. But I'd only been gone for a few minutes, surely. And this beach was not easily accessible to strangers. My heart began slamming violently against the wall of my chest as fear gripped me like a foreboding hand. And a feeling of impending dread swept over me like a hot fever. I ran with my bare feet kicking up the soft sea sand and my breathing fast and furious, very raspy. When I got close to the playpen, I was completely out of breath. Then I saw them. But what I saw was not your average human being, which is what I was expecting to see. I wasn't sure that this was a good thing or not. What I was observing was two cinnamon-coloured female Bigfoots, and I hastened to say I was more than a little befuddled. I honestly did not know how to react. I mean, how do you react when you encounter two tall, lofty, hairy human-like beings that are easily over nine foot tall, with overlong arms, pyramid-shaped heads, and ponderous shoulders, with human faces. I noticed one of the female Bigfoots had a baby on her shoulders, possibly of a similar age to Petra. I couldn't be sure. The little baby was gurgling away happily on its mother's shoulders, pulling her long hair, as if it was a lovely game. The other was holding little Petra in her overlong arms, and rocking her lovingly up and down. And Petra was gurgling with delight. <laughs> Why was she not scared of this great big creature? When Mrs. Wingborn picked Petra up, she'd howl. But in this Bigfoot's arms, a perfect stranger to her, she seemed incredibly content. I could hear the two female Bigfoots were engaged in an intense but earnest conversation together, where they spoke to each other backwards and forwards, in a strange foreign language, at a very fast pace. Kila kikwa, hokila sika, omokola bisa, ashakwi. I didn't understand what they were saying, but I suspected they were talking about little Petra. I cannot be sure about that, but their eyes were focused on her all the time. I could see by their delighted expressions they found Petra exceedingly cute, but then everybody did. I was afraid they were going to steal her away. I mean, I didn't stand a chance, did I? fighting off two powerful creatures like this, who were built like robust army tanks. I've heard stories from the past about Bigfoots abducting children. Whether they're true or not, I don't know. But I thought they were fictitious at the time. Anyway, I'd never actually believed that Bigfoot was real. Until now, of course. Should I be worried that these two female Bigfoots were about to abduct little Petra? And if they did, how would Mrs. Wingborn react? If I returned back to the house and told her, Sorry, Mrs. Wingborn, but two female Bigfoots abducted little Petra. Number one, that woman wouldn't believe a word of it. Number two, she'd think I belonged on a funny farm. And number three, she'd likely think I was behind the abduction of her daughter, using Bigfoot as a cunning roux to pinch her daughter from beneath her nose. There is no telling what Mrs. Wingborn would actually think. The two Bigfoots were oblivious to my presence but I couldn't allow them to take little Petra. I had to stop them, if that was their intention. Excuse me, came a pathetic mouse-like voice that I realised belonged to me. The two Bigfoot females swung around to stare at me. One was still rocking little Petra in her arms. 
They looked at me through treacle-coloured eyes, staring at me curiously. Then the Bigfoot holding Petra spoke to me, with a quite a stern note in her voice, in a language that curiously downloaded itself into my head in English. I mean, how does that happen? Kilakwika! Ha kilako! Anakisanakwa! Ho baki! You shouldn't have left your girl unattended. Where is the watcher? Do you not have a watcher for the child? I'm the one watching over her, I explained. The Bigfoot holding little Petra nodded. She put little Petra back in her playpen. She studied me again through her dark eyes. I know it sounds strange, but I felt as if she could look right through me, as if she knew everything about me and could read my very thoughts. It made me feel very exposed and vulnerable, almost as if I was completely naked. Kikwasa! I'm not judging you, she said. Kulopikasi! Ha kikwana! Homo kolonaki! Kilasika kulusta! Mikashunaka kulusta! Ikikakolo! Hisakwashina! I'm not judging you, she said. But children need to be watched. And you weren't watching her, were you? The ocean is dangerous, and Kulusta might have pinched her. Kulusta is dangerous. He cannot be trusted. He has a very bad reputation, and the rumour is he's been seen around the area. So everyone needs to watch out. But I was I was only gone for a minute, I said sheepishly. Who is Kalusta? A mushakin. Sorry, what's a mushakon? It just means he's not very good. He's very bad. If he sees a baby alone on the beach, he will abduct her. You need to be very careful. I can't say that enough. Let's just say Kulusta is hard to pin down. Otherwise, we would have all taken him out a long time ago. But he's twice our size. If he's around, you can't leave a baby unattended on a beach. There is no telling what he could do or what he is capable of. He is not right in the head. And he is very good at cloaking himself so that even his own kind cannot find him. Twice their size, I was thinking. You've got to be kidding me. Were they suggesting there was a monstrous baby-snatching Bigfoot around who could not be trusted and was twice their size? These two female Bigfoots were nine foot tall, easily 700 pounds. How much bigger was this Kulister? The Bigfoot read my mind and answered, Kilakwa, Horsa, he's a giant, she told me simply. The Bigfoot looked at me through kind eyes. We didn't mean to scare you like this. We mean you no harm. But you were gone for more than a minute, weren't you? We were exceedingly worried. We've been here for a while, watching over her for you. If Kulusta is around, you would be in serious trouble. My face went as red as a field of poppies. They were probably right, although I didn't want to admit it to myself. It was easy to get distracted by these rock pools, and maybe I'd been so absorbed that I'd forgotten all about little Petra, and the tie may have just slipped through my fingers like butter. I felt suddenly very ashamed of myself. We just need to warn you about Kulusta. We've sent a message to Rosalind, who will take him out as soon as he gets here. If anyone can sniff out Kulusta, it's Rosalind. Sorry, who is Rosalind? I asked. He is my father, said the female Bigfoot who had the baby. The baby was now studying me curiously through its brown eyes. We've called him telepathically. He doesn't live in these parts, you see but he's well on his way here, and when he arrives, he'll deal with Kulusta himself. One of our kind spotted Kulusta on this very beach this morning catching crabs. Let's just say Kulusta's days are now numbered. No one can defeat my father, she told me proudly. Now that there's been a sighting of him, his days are short. Well, I hope he gets here soon. I don't want any harm to come to Petra, I told them. The Bigfoot looked at me reassuringly. Don't worry about that. We have a watcher over this beach. If Kalusta is taken out, we'll leave a white stone on the beach. That way you will know it's safe. She pointed at little Petra. She's missing her twin. When she gets upset, she grieves his loss. But he's always watching over her. You can tell her that. She's not a twin, I told the Bigfoot. She's an only child. She is a twin, said the Bigfoot. Her brother died in childbirth. Don't you even know that? No, I insisted. You must be mistaken. The Bigfoots looked at each other incredulously, as if they couldn't believe that I had no knowledge that Petra was a twin. 
I had been working for Mrs. Wingborn when she was pregnant, and surely the woman would have told me she was expecting twins. But I had to concede that these two Bigfoots had extra sensory abilities. I mean, by the sounds of things, they had telepathically communicated with another Bigfoot, who lived further afield, and asked him to come to their help in dealing with an unhinged, very dangerous, rather volatile Bigfoot. They didn't have modern technology at their disposal, like cell phones or email addresses, but they had an extraordinary innate ability in being able to communicate with each other over long distances, like elephants, at frequencies of less than 20 hertz, that are able to send out signals to each other over vast areas. So is your father going to kill this Kulusta? I asked. Kula kisa. Of course, said the female Bigfoot. Kaki kwasa, hosholo kolo, amikasa. Every bad egg needs to be exterminated. Well, now you're back with your baby. Make sure you keep your eye on her. You can't be too careful. If someone throws shells all over you, you'll know it's Kulusta. Then you'll know he's around. He's always throwing shells at people. He likes to scare anyone that crosses his path. He's very intimidating. Ikakwi, hosokolo. I then remembered how Mrs. Wingborn and Beatrix had told me in their drunken state how they'd been showered with shells. Had Calusta been watching them, while they lay sunning themselves on the beach? Had they been oblivious to the danger that they were in? Don't worry, said the female Bigfoot. Just be on your guard and all will be well. And with that the two Bigfoots ambled away and were gone, leaving me thinking, what the hell? Did that actually just happen? When I asked Mrs. Wingborn if Petra was a twin, she was astonished that I knew this. Did George tell you this? How dare he? This was our secret. I told him not to tell anyone our business. I can't believe he told you that. I was to find out that Mrs. Wingborn had given birth to two twins, one dying shortly after childbirth. But as to why this happened, she never divulged the details. I'm glad to say the next morning there was a white stone on the beach. So I knew that Kulusta had been dealt with, and the beach was now safe. It gave me an enormous sense of peace. I worked for Mrs. Wingborn for another couple of years, until I managed to get my degree, and my life went down a very different path. I'm glad my seedy apartment in the Bronx is all but a memory. From time to time I see Mrs. Wingborn around, but she hasn't changed at all. I thank my cotton socks that I'm no longer embroiled in her life, although I do miss little Petra. And I often think about the Bigfoots I encountered on that remote Oregon beach. And I ask myself, did that actually happen? But I can assure you, it most certainly did. So there you are. That's my story. Well, hello there. I hope you enjoyed the Omnibus edition. We've got many more coming our, our way for you to listen to. Sending you love wherever you are in the world, in North America, Canada, Kenya, wherever you may be, I send you lots and lots of love. Thank you for listening to my Omnibus, and I really do hope you enjoyed it, because that's the whole idea about it, is to give you some interesting stories to listen to. So until next time, goodbye and good night.